Welcome back this is part 17 of, What if Issei became the true dragon of the apocalypse, alright let's begin. Was it strange to be in a coffee shop at 11 pm? Well, yes it was. But if that seems strange, then the fact that they were playing chess in that place was even more striking. Hum, the violent sound of the first move on the board resounded within the entire cafeteria, with a small pawn standing two squares in front. Come on, Valkyries, Rossweiss exclaimed with a look completely absorbed in the game. We will win this war for the glory of Asgard, and for Odin. The woman concluded her speech, something Issei saw with slight grace. The brown-haired man only deigned to move his hair, to then take a small drink of coffee. The Valkyrie grew visibly uneasy at the move. The woman immediately narrowed her eyes and began to think carefully about her next move. Don't let the enemies infiltrate the rear, he exclaimed, moving his horse, in an attempt to predict the chestnut's next move. Don't worry, my comrades. For my honor as queen of the Valkyries, and for the honor of Asgard, I will not let any of our sacrifices go in vain. Issei just watched her in silence, to then make a move with her pawn. Before he could put the pawn in place, he could see Rossweiss tense up again. Issei returned the pawn to its original position, then moved another. In a curious, or even funny way, Rossweiss responded in kind. Issei smiled at this, making false movements a few more times, unable to help but feel embraced by the warmth and tenderness that all the Valkyrie's gestures gave off. Do you like this game very much? The brunette asked, finally completing his move. Aye. Ross's smile quickly disappeared, covering his mouth the instant he realized how he was acting. Hum, I'm sorry, she apologized, hanging her head in great shame and shame. It's just that I get carried away with this game a lot, the Valkyrie couldn't help rubbing her shoulder shyly. That's why only Lord Odin plays with me, he even sometimes makes fun of my way of acting. It looks pretty cute to me. Issei's comment made Rossweiss look at him with wide eyes. In fact, Hanamu also makes similar comments. Although he only makes them early in the game, it does not bother you. The Valkyrie almost overturned all the pieces after her childish reaction. Issei couldn't help but laugh at the sparkle in Ross's eyes. The beauty of a movement is not reflected only in its appearance, but in the thought behind it. The chestnut's words left Rossweiss even more astonished. It's something Penemu always tells me. In addition to teaching me to be smarter, she showed me what exists beyond the board. She explained the chestnut, looking at the pieces of her. That's why I perfectly understand what you feel. That's great. The Valkyrie exclaimed with a big smile. And what do you see on the board? She asked herself, really curious for the answer. Hum, Issei hummed, fixing his gaze on his pieces. Unlike you, who are the queen, I am all the pawns. The bishops would be Gaspar and Asia. The knights would be Zenobia and Kiba, while the rooks would be Kaneko and Akino. Ross couldn't help but be very curious about his last words, since he knew about Akino's true position. All of us take it upon ourselves to protect our king, and we also protect each other. He commented, then fixed his gaze on the queen. But if we can't keep up, the queen always arrives, which is translated as salvation. They are Tiamat and Penemu. He finished, then took a quick look at the board. Sometimes, the pieces can change their appearance, but they will always continue to have the same meaning. The horse may become Azazel. The tower may become Tannen. The queen may become you. He concluded, fixing her gaze on the woman. But that doesn't change anything. After all, we all continue to support and care for each other, no matter how much our lives are on the line. It's a good philosophy, but it's something quite curious what you tell me. The Valkyrie commented causing Issei to raise an eyebrow. You mentioned a king, since the king cannot defend the compatriots from him, he can only give orders and organize them. In short, he is the one in charge of the strategy. The king is Rias, she is someone I must protect at all costs, especially now that the raiding games are just around the corner. She answered the chestnut, looking at the king. I'll agree to anything you say, as long as it doesn't force me to abandon one of my friends. Oh. The Valkyrie commented with some smugness. This is the first time I've seen a rogue pawn. I'm not a rebel, Issei exclaimed with his eyes rolling. We better keep playing, because it's getting late. He concluded, watching as Rossweiss moved another piece. Come on, 
Let's not let their rebelliousness rub off on our ranks. Chapter 40. The Tragedies of the Great War. I can't believe I couldn't win once. Ross exclaimed, rubbing his hair in frustration as they entered the halls of Asgard's castle. It's not your fault. Penemu has taught me very well. Issei answered, before looking up at the ceiling. Actually, I think there's no one better than her. These last words ignited Rossweiss's curiosity. How many times have you played with her? She asked herself, causing Issei to rub his chin. Since it was part of my training, they went many times, the brown-haired man answered, clearly doubtful. I guess it must be around 500 times. And how many times have you won? Rossweiss added another question, showing even more curiosity. Counting the time she was distracted, she asked herself, receiving a quick nod from the Valkyrie. A. Issei's response made them both stop. Just once, Rossweiss questioned, genuinely impressed. I already told you, she's the best at that game. Issei finished, taking the doorknob. Wait, Rossweiss stepped in front of him, interrupting him in a very surprising way. What's going on? The brown-haired man asked, seeing how the Valkyrie shyly moved her hands behind her waist. I wanted to give you this. Issei couldn't help but be impressed when the woman held out both hands in front of her, showing her a beautiful silver flower that fit perfectly in both of her hands. It's a silver ranbar, a flower that only grows in Asgard. It turns bright pink when it falls on Midgard. Thank you, the brown-haired man replied without hiding his astonishment. But why are you giving me this? Well, these days that I've been with you and the girls have been a lot of fun, he replied, unable to avoid lowering his gaze with a little embarrassed blush. Although it all started with practice, I ended up enjoying a lot every time we went to fairs and other places, like that peculiar cafe manga. Issei couldn't help but laugh after remembering that visit. Damn, I never thought I'd run into a magical girl fan in that place. I almost died of a heart attack, Issei commented, unable to help but remember that scene where Rossweiss laughed while the subject was tormenting him with endless questions. They both laughed for a few more seconds, until they resumed the conversation. I just wanted to say that I had a lot of fun. She continued the Valkyrie, causing Issei to greet her with a toothy smile. There are only two days left before we go our separate ways, so I just wanted to let you know how grateful I am. She finished, curtsying a little as a sign of thanks. Leave that, Issei waved his hands violently, causing Ross to look at him in slight surprise. I don't think the future queen of the Valkyries should do that kind of thing. He explained he, see you, tomorrow, he concluded, opening the door and saying goodbye with a quick greeting. As soon as the door closed, Rossweiss couldn't help but stare at nothing, her gaze seeming to grow a bit depressing. The future queen, she whispered to herself, unable to help but let out a big sigh at the end. As soon as he entered the room, Issei turned on the light out of pure reflex, taking in a completely enchanting sight. Hug, Penemu, turn off the light, Tiamat was lying on her back. The blankets that covered her body were covering less than half of her body so her beautiful rear was completely visible, and she looked even more sensual with those little light blue panties. The dragon's face was buried in the pillow, so her babbling could barely be heard. Shut up! Penemu sounded just as bad, since the cadre also had the pillow pushed into her face, although it was because she was hugging her tightly. Her body was completely exposed, but her white pajamas covered her completely. Or at least that's what she tried to do, since the enormous cleavage that she presented, due to her pressing against the pillow, was impossible to hide. Despite looking hot as hell, Issei didn't have any obscene thoughts cross his mind. In fact, she had only been able to look at them with affection and amusement after hearing the babbling of both women. Sorry, I'll turn it off already. He commented on the chestnut, turning off the light. Issei, come to bed, Tiamat turned her face, where you could see that she was more asleep than awake. Issei just walked over quietly and lay back as gently as possible. He couldn't help but blush as the two women jumped on him, hugging him from both sides. That blush quickly turned into annoyance, since she could hear how her tenant seemed to be having too much fun with the situation presented. The next day, Issei was walking among the busy streets of Asgard, and he was visibly surprised. After all, all those Valkyries that he could recognize were shopping and having fun in different stalls, where some of them were accompanied by their fiancés, or at least, 
that's what they appeared to be. Why isn't anyone training? She couldn't help but think, seeing how all the warriors of Asgard were just having fun. Maybe Ross is around here. Right after thinking that, the brown-haired man collided heavily with a woman, who didn't flinch, unlike Issei who fell to the ground in a resounding manner. Are you okay? The woman asked, taking her hand. Yes, it was my fault, I was distracted, the brunette apologized, accepting the woman's hand. Oh, it's you, Gondal explained, making Issei slightly surprised. If I remember correctly, you are Rossweiss's grandmother. The chestnut commented, brushing off the dirt. What are you doing here? The woman questioned, unable to avoid raising an eyebrow. I thought you would be training with my granddaughter. Actually, I'm looking for her. Issei replied, looking at the Valkyries. I woke up a bit later and didn't find anyone at the rally. In fact, I'm seeing that all the Valkyries are around here. That's because it's his day off. The answer surprised the chestnut. I thought Valkyries never had that kind of thing, she commented with genuine curiosity, rubbing her hair. There are only two days when all of Asgard celebrates, declared the woman. Today marks 1002 years since the end of the Great War. It is a commemoration of our victory, and, above all, our survival. The latter drew the chestnut's attention even more. Now that I think about it, everyone talks about the Great War as a catastrophic event. And you wonder how everything can be so quiet. The woman concluded Issei's thought, receiving a nod from him. That happens only because you listen to the point of view of the factions less affected by the war. Obviously, you can't have the point of view of the factions that died out, but I'll tell you something, he explained, placing a hand on the shoulder of Issei, at the same time that he brought his face closer. Trihexa not only wiped out numerous races, but completely destroyed a large number of kingdoms. This statement made Issei jump. Wait, when you say realms, you mean, Gondol nodded, confirming Issei's suspicions. Entire worlds were destroyed, Gondol would raise one of his hands, creating different cities with his magic. Helheim, Nifelheim, Svartalheim, Jochenheim, Alfheim, Vanaheim, Babylon, none. A great number of cities kept appearing, until finally he came to a very peculiar one. Even Valhalla, he finished and then stared at him. Of Viking beliefs, only two kingdoms survived. Wait a minute, wasn't Valhalla a very important kind of myth? He asked her, trying to remember more about the mythology. We Valkyries originally resided there to train the greatest Viking warriors and saints in history. The current queen of the Valkyries explained. Unfortunately, with the arrival of the 10th century, our believers were declining enormously, and we ended up devoured by Christianity, just like the Greek gods. At the beginning of the 11th century, no more warriors arrived, so Valhalla had lost much of its usefulness, only Serbia to continue training with the current warriors. When the Great War finally came, Trihexa completely destroyed the Valhalla army, taking with it all the holy warriors and a large number of our Valkyries. In that battle Ragnar died after saving his daughter, while the Valkyrie queen of that time saved me. Gondol raised his hand to his face, touching the large scar that ran all the way around his eye. She was called Sigurdrifa, she was my daughter and Rossweiss's mother. Upon hearing the final statement, Issei couldn't help but widen his eyes. Ragnar was the husband of Sigurdrifa, and he sacrificed his life to save his daughter, who knew that if the last trace of Dysir's divine blood was lost, there would be no more Valkyrie queens in the future, since I can no longer have more children. Although if you ask me, that was just an excuse to save Rossweiss, since she was always characterized by loving her children very much. Issei couldn't help but widen his eyes. Ragnar was the husband of Sigurdrifa, and he sacrificed his life to save his daughter, who knew that if the last trace of Dysir's divine blood was lost, there would be no more Valkyrie queens in the future, since I can no longer have more children. Although if you ask me, that was just an excuse to save Rossweiss, since she always loved her children very much. Issei couldn't help but widen his eyes. Ragnar was the husband of Sigurdrifa, and he sacrificed his life to save his daughter, who knew that if the last trace of Dysir's divine blood was lost, there would be no more Valkyrie queens in the future, since I can no longer have more children. Although if you ask me, that was just an excuse to save Rossweiss, since she always loved her children very much. Wait, does that mean Rossweiss has a brother? He asked her, receiving a nod from the woman. At that time, 
he was only three years old. He couldn't bear everything he had been through, and he was missing for a great number of years. Gondal remembers how Ross had felt devastated after the disappearance of her little brother. When we all thought he was dead, he appeared in Asgard 300 years ago. His attitude is somewhat cold, and he doesn't remember anyone's name or face even if he sees them a hundred times, that's because of the traumas he suffered, lived. She explained herself, to then outline a small smile. He can only remember very important faces and names, as well as his sister, Lord Odin, or mine. And where is he now? He asked the chestnut with great intrigue, since he had never heard of the man. Roswell is the last Viking warrior in history. His duty is to protect Asgard from any problems, and to solve them before they start. It is a very troublesome job, since he always has to work very far from Asgard, so he is never there, present. He concluded, then crossed his arms. If Rosweiss is Lord Odin's right-hand man, Roswell is his shadow. Hum, you make him sound like someone very strong. The brunette commented, even more intrigued. It is said that Roswell ended up in the hands of a very powerful dragon, since all his viking moves are combined with the technique of dragons. The woman explained, I don't know if this is true, but whoever he is, he has raised him very well, and he has grown into quite a strong boy, although he is still quite inferior to his sister. After all, the Disir branch only runs for the women. A very powerful dragon, Issei thought, rubbing his chin. Soon after, her eyes widened as a possible answer crossed her mind. Wait, it wouldn't have been. Talking about what happened so long ago makes me feel a little old. Gondal thought aloud, unable to avoid drawing a nostalgic look. Who knew that she would now be so worried about Ross? This last statement made the brunette look at her with some alertness. What's wrong with her? He asked, earning a small glare from Gondal. Being the future Valkyrie Queen attracts some troublesome people. The woman narrowed her eyes, denoting great annoyance. All those problems can be simplified into three words, pride, greed and contempt. What are you talking about? Issei asked, even more worried after hearing those words. Forget it, it's not like you can do anything now, he commented, completely deflecting the topic, although Issei still seemed to want to inquire about it. That doesn't matter, as long as she's happy. And apparently, now she adores you and you've become her best friend. She explained with a smile, and this time it served to soothe the chestnut's worries. She was always very bitter lately, so thank you very much for making her smile again. Well, to tell you the truth, she's not the only one who's been having a good time. The brown commented with slight discomfort at the flattery, then startled slightly when Tiamat's voice resounded in his ear through a small circle. Magical. Issei. What are you doing in that place? The dragon asked. We have been waiting for you in the mountains for half an hour. In the mountains, he exclaimed she, finally understanding the reason for not finding them anywhere. Wait, how do I know where? Issei's eyes rolled back as she heard Tiamat grumble slightly, looking like she was having a little fight with Penemu. Listen to me, Deidre Wielder. Penemu's cold forceful voice made Issei freeze. If you don't get here in 10 seconds, I'll take care of roasting your bat wings in a huge bonfire without cutting them off. But but, Issei yelled with a completely pale face, making Gondal look very amused by what was happening. Take it easy, the dragon exclaimed, remember we have our family packed. Just focus and teleport to where I am. She finished, making Issei squeeze her eyes shut. I already forgot about that ability, she thought to herself, before leaving in a magic circle. His movement was so fast and desperate, that he couldn't even say goodbye to Gondal. The woman only deigned to observe with a smile where the figure of Issei was before. I suppose that his arrival can bring nice surprises in the future. And not only him, there are also those two women, he thought aloud, remembering that Issei was being accompanied by a dragon queen and God's rightful heir. Without a doubt, it is a very curious trio. Several hours later, Penemu and Tiamat were walking behind Issei and Rosweiss, both of them seeming to be talking happily. Tomorrow is already the last day, she declared the cadre, receiving a nod from the dragoness. Do you remember the plan? Do you think it will work? Tiamat asked, not quite sure of the plan. I have no doubts, especially, after the bet you mentioned to me. Penemu replied, causing the dragoness to bow her shoulders. 
if you say so. This time I want to go to a restaurant. The Valkyrie exclaimed, making the brunette rub her hair. Okay, I know a few in Kuo. Issei's face turned slightly pale. The problem is that they are very expensive. She thought her, if it hadn't been for Azazel's gift, I don't know how she would have gotten through all of this. In that case, I, Rossweiss didn't finish speaking, as the castle gate opened, denoting a tall blonde man with extremely long hair and a slightly disheveled beard. His outfit consisted of one very similar to Odin's, although he flaunted even more luxury. Issei couldn't help but be impressed by the presence and the change in the environment that the man generated with just his presence. The fact that he was as tall as Penemu and that his muscles were the most impressive he had ever seen, further enlarged the image of him. Although that aura was not something imposing. Rather, it was just something unpleasant, and that produced great fear. Look who we have here, I was looking for you. The man declared, fixing his gaze on Rossweiss with a somewhat strange smile. Though, Apparently, I came at a bad time. He concluded, watching as he was being accompanied by Issei. Uh, th Thor. Ross looked incredibly nervous, something that caught the attention of the other two women present. Seeing how Penemu and Tiamat were looking at him, the god looked at them with a somewhat curious smile, although her gaze focused mainly on the dragon. So, it's true that the dragon queen is taking care of the little reincarnated devil, he commented, where his eyes had an evil glint for a short second. This is interesting. Tiamat and Penemu just raised their eyebrows, while Rossweiss looked very uncomfortable at the comment, since she had perfectly discovered the true intentions of the god. After all, she knew him very well. Wait, are you the old man's son? Thor couldn't help but give him a dirty look after the prefix. Why did you say you were too busy to help him, if you're here right now? He questioned the chestnut, something that made the god a little more angry. Yes. I am very busy. The god answered with a seber voice, making Issei very nervous. Today I'm going to Midgard to rent a hotel and a couple of whores to get drunk and fuck for three days straight. The god declared, crossing his arms. You have a problem with that. Of course not man, relax. He exclaimed the brunette, raising both his hands in defense. One more thing, the god declared, staring at him. In my presence, don't you dare call the god such a derogatory term. It's not right for someone inferior to create an equal. Issei was about to answer him, but Rossweiss got between them. You said you were looking for me. The Valkyrie intervened, with a clear fake smile on her face. What do you wish? She asked herself, making Thor distracted. I just wanted to remind you that you have some very important lessons tomorrow. Since my father is not here, I will take care of supervising your learning in the future role you play. The god declared, causing the Valkyrie to look down at him. But, we had agreed with Lord Odin that I would be forced to do it only one day before my birthday, he commented under his breath, making Thor take a step forward. As I said before, I'm the one in charge now. You can't disobey, the god declared, causing the Valkyrie to lower her gaze further from him. Issei was about to intervene, but Penemu grabbed his shoulder. The brown haired turned his gaze, seeing how the Kadri shook her head, indicating that she should not meddle in matters that he did not understand. Besides, it's in vain to delay it. Thor shrugged. No matter how long you wait, you know very well that no one will propose to you. He concluded, only to see how small tears began to appear in the Valkyrie's eyes. This caused the god to pat his face and heave a great sigh. If you do, I'll send my hammer to the security as a little help. This made Ross look at him for a few seconds, before nodding. Okay, he declared, receiving a nod from the god. He was confident that the brat won't be so useless, and will be able to lift Mjolnir. She concluded, looking at Issei, to then fix her gaze on the other two ladies. I'll start with her first. It's the greatest banquet, he thought, fixing her gaze on Tiamat for a brief second. It was nice to meet you ladies. It was nice to meet the current Deidre wielder as well. She finished, curtsying politely. The god would disappear through a magic circle, without first giving Rossweiss a look, forcing her to look away. Are you okay? Issei asked, positioning a hand on the Valkyrie man. Rossweiss quickly changed her expression and gave him a big smile. So where shall we go? She asked with great emotion, diverting the subject again. 
This made Issei smile after remembering the words that Rossweiss had told him yesterday. Although it all started with practice, I ended up really enjoying all the times we went to fairs and other places, like that peculiar manga cafe. I have a very good place in mind. She answered the brown one, causing Ross's eyes to light up with great impetus. Meanwhile, Penemu and Tiamat looked at each other. Their looks completely serious, suspecting many things. Once they both left for dinner and said goodbye to the two women, they both entered the castle, heading towards the room. This is all very weird, don't you think? Questioned Penemu, receiving a nod from Tiamat. Issei noticed it too, but he preferred to distract her from her worries instead of getting into them. She answered the dragon, surely she wants Rossweiss to tell her about her problems herself. Knowing Issei, if she doesn't tell him in a certain amount of time, he'll start pushing and digging into it a lot. She declared the cadre, unable to help but smile as she remembered how she herself had begun to fall in love with him. I say this from experience. Let's leave it in their hands, declared the dragon. If she needs a little push, we'll be happy to help. She finished, receiving a nod from the cadre. Besides, it's not a good idea for him to mess with the affairs of a god with his current state of power. She cleared the cadre, opening the bedroom door for her. Especially with one like Thor. I could see that he doesn't bother you until the right time. She declared the dragon with full confidence, while a somewhat evil smile spread on her face. I'd rather not get in trouble with Asgard. He declared the cadre with a nervous drop of sweat. Grigori could be very affected by it. She concluded. You're so boring. The dragon commented with a small pout as she looked away. Are you going in or not? Penemu asked, removing her clothes and leaving her topless. Give me five minutes, she replied, looking at the nearest window. Penemu only deigned to look at her strangely, and then bowed her shoulders. Whatever you want, she replied, putting on her white pajamas. Don't make noise when you come. In, she finished, closing the door. Tiamat went to the window and looked at the starry sky, unable to avoid drawing a somewhat downcast smile. How annoying it is to feel emotions ten times stronger than any other species. He thought, settling into the sail even more. I never thought it would bother me so much to see how Issei goes out with another woman every night without him inviting me to. She continued her thoughts, opting for a somewhat teasing smile. Is this known as jealousy? She sneered at herself at the question. After all, that feeling had always been mixed with hatred, madness, and fury in her past. It is the first time that this feeling was reflected in such a pure way in his body. Her internal debates were interrupted when she felt a presence behind her. The dragon turned her gaze, seeing that it was someone somewhat peculiar. I thought you had gone to Midgard. She commented herself, without giving it much importance. What do you want, God? It's what I was going to do. But I couldn't ignore the presence of a woman of your caliber in this place. Thor declared, causing Tiamat to look sideways at him. I will be concise and direct. The god commented, narrowing his eyes with some malice. I want you to be my woman from now on. Tiamat couldn't help but let out a small mocking laugh, then turned around and stared at him. You've gone mad, she questioned herself, unable to help but look at him as if he was a complete jerk. Thor simply approached while laughing, then positioned himself next to her ear. I think so, she answered in a whisper, a completely mischievous whisper, just like her intentions. After all, I plan to kill that brat you protect so much if you don't let me be with you, she commented, making Tiamat's eyes widen at him. Are you threatening me? Thor couldn't help but be slightly surprised, since the woman seemed to be minimally affected by his words. It's not a threat, just a warning. He quickly cleared the god, pulling away from the dragon's ear. I promise to treat you as my most important woman, and I will make you feel like a true queen. He declared, taking the dragon's hand, who only observed her gesture without the slightest expression on her face. Come on, I know you're a virgin. You must be very curious about how it feels to sail among the stars. I can make you feel that way, and even take you further. She concluded with a big confident smile. Let's go to my room. The god turned around, making the worst mistake of his. The worst mistake of all arrogant god, will always be his overconfidence. Tiamat's comment left her lips with a completely gloomy smile. The god was surprised when the dragon used her hand that was being grabbed by Thor 
flexing it back and placing it in the middle of his back, before making a quick tackle that knocked him to the ground in a matter of seconds. Tiamat quickly moved her hand to her waist and stepped on it with her foot, then took her other hand and held it out as the dragon lay standing on top of the god. Thor just laughed at the situation. Come on, stop playing, Thor's eyes widened in shock as he realized something. I can not feel my legs, he thought to himself, glancing sideways as Tiamat was stepping on his waist. She's stepping on a nerve spot. The last time I had fun was in my fight against the White Dragon Emperor and that Kadri I don't even remember his name. The dragon commented, tensing Thor's arm even more, being about to dislocate it. But, you came as a volunteer, that's fantastic. The god simply laughed, though the sweat on his face indicated that he was getting nervous at the increasing sadistic attitude of the dragon. So, you say you'll do something to Issei if I don't go with you, he commented, taking one of his fingers delicately, while still holding it still. You threatened me, so I'll threaten you too, she commented with a completely dark and sadistic expression on her face. From one second to the next, Tiamat turned the god's index finger back, causing an unpleasant sound to be heard, and Thor's eyes widened and his teeth clenched at the sudden intense wave of pain. If you touch Issei, or dare to threaten Penemu, Tiamat broke another of the god's fingers, causing his expression to tighten even more. I'll break all the fingers of your hand, one by one, he commented, then stomped on it with even more force, getting closer to the god's ear. Next, I'll break your toes. When you beg me to stop, I'll dislocate your elbows and shoulders. Then I'll follow through with your knees, making them pure. He declared himself, breaking another finger, causing a small gasp to be heard from the god. Then, I'll rip out one of your teeth for every scream you've ever made. When I finally get bored of your stupid misery, I'll cut off your limbs, one by one, he commented, causing a large nail made of ice to appear on one of his fingers that seemed to be very sharp. I'll force you to be conscious when I finally get to your head, and plunge my sharp nails into your eyes, then rip your head off. She threatened him, moving away from her ear, then sitting on top of her back. Though I think your threat is still better, she commented innocently, making the god look sideways at her. I know, the dragon snapped her two ice nails, then flashed a smile that made the god swallow deeply. It would be better to start on the part of your body that you are most proud of, right? She commented, making her icy eyes shine in a creepy way as she waved her two ice nails violently. I'll cut your balls off. Though I think your threat is still better, she commented innocently, causing the god to look at her sideways. I know. The dragon snapped her two ice nails, then flashed a smile that made the god swallow deeply. It would be better to start on the part of your body that you are most proud of, right? She commented, making her icy eyes shine in a creepy way as she waved her two ice nails violently. I'll cut your balls off. Though I think your threat is still better, she commented innocently, causing the god to look at her sideways. I know. The dragon snapped her two ice nails, then flashed a smile that made the god swallow deeply. It would be better to start on the part of your body that you are most proud of, right? She commented, making her icy eyes shine in a creepy way as she waved her two ice nails violently. I'll cut your balls off, causing its icy eyes to shine in a creepy manner as it waved its two ice nails violently. I'll cut your balls off causing its icy eyes to shine in a creepy manner as it waved its two ice nails violently. I'll cut your balls off. These last words made the god sweat immensely. Okay, damn it, the god shouted, I won't lay a finger on any of you, he exclaimed, being immensely surprised when the dragon was no longer on his back, and she was standing in front of him as she looked down on him. The floor is where you all belong, she concluded the dragon, then turned around. Don't forget who you're talking to, miserable god. She concluded herself, leaving. The god only watched as the dragon queen entered a room, then rose from the floor. For the gods, he exclaimed, completely surprised. How can the two of them live with a completely crazy woman? He questioned, fixing his three broken fingers with his other hand, barely showing a small expression of pain. These two are some of the most peculiar and beautiful women I've ever met, but I'm not going to risk my balls for them. He concluded, leaving the place through a magic circle. Meanwhile, in Kuo, hum, Issei would think carefully as he looked at the letter. I've never been to this place, 
the elections are a bit strange. He would think, not realizing that Rossweiss was staring at him. After a few seconds, Issei's eyes widened slightly. Maybe this, he wondered aloud, do you want me to buy it for you? The Valkyrie asked, getting up from her seat and sitting next to the brunette. Hmm, maybe this one is better, Issei looked at another selection, not giving Ross's words much thought. Do you want me to buy it for you? He asked the Valkyrie again with a tender smile, getting a little closer to her chestnut. Or maybe this, he thought aloud again, pointing to a hamburger that seemed to be one of the most expensive on the menu. Do you want me to buy it for you? In these moments, the brown-haired man couldn't help but roll his eyes. He looked at the woman, who seemed too hopeful to buy him something from her. Well, if you want, the brunette commented with a nervous smile when he saw the enormous glow that surrounded Rossweiss. How could buying him some food make him so happy? Without a doubt, she was a very simple woman. After the waitress arrived and they both took their order, they were happily chatting. Rossweiss didn't seem to notice that she had sat too close to Issei, while he didn't seem to mind directly. Finally, the bill arrived, and when Rossweiss paid, Issei could see that his wallet had been left completely empty, something that surprised him a lot. That was delicious, the Valkyrie exclaimed, leaving the premises together with Issei, although he stayed a little behind. You do not think the same, she asked herself, turning around to look at the brunette. Hey, how much money do you have left? Issei deflected the subject, causing the Valkyrie's face to tighten slightly. Well, the truth is that today I spent my last savings. She responded with a forced laugh as she rubbed at her hair. Since I am the future Queen Valkyrie and I am in constant training, let's just say that I belong to no man's land and I don't have a really permanent job. It's complicated, she concluded, unable to avoid lowering her gaze with some regret. And you paid for my food knowing you'd be penniless. He questioned the brunette, raising an eyebrow as he crossed his arms. Don't worry about that, the Valkyrie exclaimed quickly, waving her hands to emphasize her words. Her arms lowered slowly, unable to avoid looking down at her and smiling shyly. It was a way of thanking you, she commented, before squeezing her hands tightly. After all, today will be the last day. Ah, so that's it. The brunette commented between laughs, causing Rossweiss to give him a frown. Hey, she exclaimed, pointing incriminatingly. Don't make fun of my good deed. Did you really spend all your money on me? She questioned again as she stopped laughing, extending one of her hands. Let me check it out. Look with your own eyes. She declared the Valkyrie with a small snort, handing him her wallet. Opening it, Issei observed that it was completely empty, there were only a couple of cards and other things that seemed to be various false documents, since obviously Rossweiss didn't live in Midgard. Now do you see it? Rossweiss asked with great seriousness, to later get confused when Issei didn't take his eyes off the wallet. I never thought that this journey with you would entertain me so much. The chestnut's words only made the Valkyrie even more confused. You're not the only one who's grateful. She commented, walking past her as she placed a hand in her pocket and stuffed several bills into the wallet. Many thanks for everything, she concluded, handing him the wallet. Issei kept walking, while Rossweiss started looking at the amount of money he had given her, being surprised by what she was seeing. Wait, you gave me five times the value of what we bought today, the Valkyrie commented with wide eyes. Knowing that she wouldn't accept something like that, Issei turned around and raised one of his hands. Rossweiss couldn't help but widen her eyes even more when Issei gave her a beaming smile. Perhaps it had just been her imagination, but she was sure that at that moment, an aura completely surrounded him. An aura that only she could see. An aura covered with warmth and affection. You already gave me your present, this is mine. She finished, then gave him the thumbs up. Issei simply turned around and continued walking, while placing his hands in his pockets. Rossweiss could only look at her wallet once more, before lowering her head. Thank you, she whispered to herself, while a small blush spread on her face. So, are we back yet? The chestnut asked with a big smile. Rossweiss simply smiled and quickly ran to her side, showing that she was delighted with her presence. See, the next day, Penemu slowly opened her eyes, then sat up in bed and did a great stretch. 
His gaze quickly went to the place where there was always someone in these last days, but he realized that said person was not there. Hey, hey, the Kadri whispered, shaking Tiamat awake. Then you complain, the dragon whispered under her breath, hugging the pillow even tighter. What do you want? Do you know where Issei is? The Kadri asked, making Tiamat sit up on the bed as she gave a wide yawn. Give me a second, she commented closing her eyes, at the same time that the seal of family bond between her and the brown-haired man shone brightly above her breasts. He's in the mountains, I think he started training a bit earlier. She commented the dragon after a few seconds. Most likely, she feels a little guilty for being so late yesterday, the Kadri thought aloud, getting up from the bed with a small jump. Is she in the place we usually go? She asked herself, receiving a quick nod from the dragon. You go find Rossweiss. He said he could spend half an hour with us before he left. She declared herself, taking off her pajamas and materializing her typical combat clothing, although this time she wasn't wearing her ultra-heavy tunic. Remember, don't be afraid to damage it. Tiamat simply nodded, although his face changed to a slightly serious one after the words heard. During the first training sessions he wasn't that annoying, but now that I love him so much, it's hard for me to hurt him, the dragon would think rubbing her hair with great annoyance. Meanwhile, in the mountains of Asgard, an icy breath ran through the chestnut's lips as he exhaled and inhaled with great calm. His eyes were closed, while he had the armor on. One of his arms was flexed back, indicating that he was preparing an attack. After a few seconds, his fist was surrounded by a rather thin crimson energy, indicating that he was concentrating his magic in his hand. Burial of Ice, he whispered under his breath, throwing a hard punch forward. The contained magic was ejected from her fist, creating a strong blizzard in the shape of a reddish whirlpool. But it was just that, a whirlpool. Issei couldn't help but sigh as he closed and opened his hand. I used half of my magic, but I was only able to create some wind, she thought aloud. Though that's progress, she concluded with a small smile. I see you are practicing magical manipulation. Penemu declared, causing Issei to flinch slightly at the unexpected arrival of the Kadri. Yes, although there's nothing I can do if my magical reserves are so ridiculous, the brunette commented, rubbing his hair. With a nervous laugh, did Tiamat teach you? The Kadri asked, approaching the chestnut as she received a nod from him. So, it's only natural that it seems so simple to her. After all, a dragon king is born with an absurd amount of magic, plus he already learns to control it within a few years of obtaining it. The Kadri's comment confused the chestnut a bit. Actually, the most difficult thing about magical manipulation is being able to control it at will. And I don't mean materializing it, but creating the link between your body and the magical energy that you release to the outside. You need the magic to be linked to the perfectly with your muscles to be able to make a destructive attack. And from what I see, Having such small magical reserves made your job much easier. She explained, and then materialized his katana. Also, there are others that link magic to certain objects. For example, Penemu would wave his katana violently. I link my magic to my katana. He commented to her, to then fix her gaze on Issei again. Although this binding is much more complicated than the first. But, that's not the case when we talk about you. What are you talking about? Issei asked with great curiosity. By having the boosted gear, you have the transfer ability. Remember when I explained all the variants you can use with the transfer? Penemu replied, it took me over 8,500 years to be able to control my magic like that, but you can do it from day one. It's a great advantage, and you should take advantage of it. He concluded, taking several steps forward. When you have enough magic, you can do these kinds of attacks without any training. He declared her, placing his hand on her katana. This is my strongest attack. Penemu slowly slid her hand over the metal of the katana, making the sword turn a very bright violet color that seemed to be about to explode. Some violet rays began to be expelled from the metal, generating unbearable squeaks, since they did not stop coming out at an enormous speed. Issei could only cover his face from the intense brightness, while Penemu grabbed the katana with both hands. Bloody Twilight thousand rays. Penemu swung the katana so fast that Issei could barely make out said movements. The glow quickly faded, allowing the brunette to see clearly. 
Issei's eyes were fixed on a dozen wind currents made of magic and lightning that were going straight towards a mountain, and with a speed that was very difficult to follow. Even though it was miles away, the attack was not long in coming. Issei only narrowed his eyes when he saw that the magical attacks disappeared on the mountain, it seemed that it had not suffered any damage. From one second to the next, half of the mountain shattered into small cubes, which were quickly disintegrated by the lightning still surrounding him, causing Issei's eyes to widen in shock. The brown-haired man had no other option but to cover his face when the gusts of such an immense attack reached where he was. Different avalanches were caused in the nearest mountains, increasing the visual impact that the attack had given. The avalanches were quickly stopped when huge walls of ice were positioned in front of them, slightly surprising the chestnut tree. I see you were having fun without us. Tiamat commented, coming into action along with Rossweiss, who landed a small whack on Penemu's head. Be careful with your actions. The Valkyrie exclaimed with a frown. Remember that Asgard is very close. This attack doesn't require as much magical power as what you were trying to use. Still, you're still a long way from being able to use it. Penemu olympically ignored Rossweiss while he rubbed his bruised sector. Perhaps now you can only create about three magical currents, and you'd pass out. Ross only deigned to pout a little when he saw that he wasn't paying attention to her. Being the boosted gear, the evolutions will give you a great increase in power, and that influences your magic reserves. He explained the cadre, then waved her hand dismissively. But that's still a long way to go, so you'd better go step by step. He concluded making it very clear to Issei to stop concentrating on magical manipulation, even for now. I perfectly understand, Issei nodded, then smiled slightly. Besides, she told me that she already controlled the two factors necessary to achieve it. Therefore, there is no reason to continue training that, she thought to herself, coming to a good conclusion. Now, the important thing is that you learn how to awaken your balance breaker ultimate ability. The cadre commented, making Issei pay special attention. After all, he had been waiting for this moment all week. Reuse the explosion, Penemu serious her gaze more than normal, fixing her gaze on Tiamat. She's the only one who can help you with that. She commented herself, causing Issei to fix her gaze on Tiamat in great surprise. And how can you help me? The brown-haired man asked, seeing how a rather subjective smile appeared on the dragon's face after the question. Penemu fixed her gaze on Issei, crossing her arms. Then End of have arc a match. chapter 41, the ultimate power of the balance breaker. Issei materialized his katana, slowly removing the sheath from it. The chestnut never took his gaze from the sword, until he finally entered a combat stance as he fixed his gaze on Tiamat, who only watched him with her arms folded. A small current of air slipped between them, framing the great distance between them. Issei closed his eyes and took a small breath, then opened them abruptly. Both of them launched at a great speed, cutting all the distance between them in a small instant. A smile appeared on Tiamat's face, materializing her ice sword and impacting it with great force against Issei's katana, causing a scandalous metallic noise to be heard throughout the place, generating a small shock wave from the impact, making all the snow at his feet flew away. Issei continued to force his advance, to no avail as Tiamat parried the attack with no problem. As his body began to shake from using all his available strength, Issei could only deign to remain in position. Tiamat's smile widened even more when he began to hold back Issei's attack with one hand on her hilt, while he used the other to position it on the chestnut's helmet. From one second to the next, Issei's helmet broke into a thousand pieces, while the dragon held the brunette's cheeks with her hand. Is that all you have? She asked her, then brought her face closer and gave her a small kiss on the forehead. I expected more, she finished, making the chestnut clench his teeth angrily, at the same time that he tried to hide the blush that had been generated on his face by the dragon's previous action. Penemu and Rossweiss watched in the distance as Tiamat released Issei's face and created ice nails, forcing him to dodge with a small jump back. Why should this work with his ultimate ability? Rossweiss asked, watching the battle intently. Right now, there are three things on Issei's head that could condition his mind. Declared Penemu, seeing how Tiamat kept advancing with her nails, being miraculously dodged by the chestnut every time. Actually, there are four, but the Asgardians don't know anything about the prophecy, she thought to herself. 
In third place, is Valley. It's clear that Issei had a great ambition to defeat him after their last battle. In second position is the ambition to protect everyone close to him. And finally, the first, after saying that, Rossweiss looked at her attentively. Before he had all those ideas, there was something else. One that came along with the idea of protecting loved ones from him. It all happened because of a bet. She explained the cadre, causing Ross to raise an eyebrow. A bet, she asked herself with great interest. Issei and Tiamat made a bet. He said that if he managed to become stronger than her, Tiamat would have to fulfill any of Issei's requests. Otherwise, if Issei gave up before he could surpass her, he would have to fulfill one of her requests. Penemu explained, then smiled. At those moments, poor Issei didn't know that he was facing a dragon queen. And for obvious reasons, that objective seemed practically impossible to achieve. Penemu couldn't help but cover her small laugh with her hand, imagining how Issei's reaction should have been when she found out who Tiamat really was. As unbelievable as it seems, he didn't give up on her. Most likely it's because of her ambition to protect her, and to surpass her. Penemu couldn't help getting serious again at her last words. After all, the one who introduced him to the supernatural world was Tiamat. She mixed her human ambitions with those of a dragon, and let's just say this turned out. He declared the cadre, crossing his arms. A reincarnated devil who loves difficult battles and seeks to maintain his pride, but he would never put his pride ahead of his comrades. A strange combination, Ross would reply with a small smile. Since he doesn't even have a demonic nature, I understand that Diedrake has something to do with it, but it's true, he commented, unable to help but rub his chin. It's funny how the little dragon blood in his body burns much stronger than all the demon blood in him. Their conversation was interrupted when a huge blizzard hit both of them, causing them to turn their gaze to the battlefield. In those moments, you could see how Tiamat had her hand extended to the front, while Issei had his back leaning back, while a small trickle of blood came from his freshly cut cheek. Issei took a large leap backwards in an attempt to distance himself and re-steady, only to have his eyes widen in disbelief as Tiamat spread her arms out to the sides, causing a dozen magic circles to appear behind her. A few small magical attacks were fired, causing Issei to respond quickly and cut all the attacks with his katana in quick and precise movements, generating small flashes of skylight that mixed with small explosions. Issei used the inertia of the explosions to continue moving backwards with even more speed, but he was surprised when Tiamat appeared out of the smoke and dust, one of her hands outstretched. Freeze. She declared with a smile, at the same time that her hand took on an icy light blue glow. Before he touched his arm, Issei created a magic circle between them that froze instantly, then shattered into a thousand pieces. Tiamat's smile disappeared when she realized that Issei had taken advantage of the ice screen to slip away. Issei gritted his teeth, making a downward lunge-like fall. It didn't take a second for the tip of his katana to impact hard against the side of Tiamat's neck, generating a small shock wave. All in the hope of doing him a little harm. Although he had already expected this resolution, Issei couldn't help but be surprised when Tiamat's neck remained perfectly. Tiamat raised her face with a smile, indicating that the attack hadn't even tickled her. She tried to attack him while he was still in the air, but Issei foresaw the movement and moved quickly, staying several meters behind her. It's been a long time since our last little fight, and now I have the chance to test you again, the dragon commented, turning around with a smile covered in amusement. This is fantastic, Tiamat, why didn't you ever tell me the difference between us? The brunette asked, pointing at her with his katana cheekily. You didn't even tell me you were a dragon queen when we made that bet. Because, she questioned the dragon, then laughed at him. It was just for fun. She accepted the blame for it, even though she didn't really feel bad about it. Now that you know you're only capable of reaching 0.8% of my power, are you going to give up? She asked herself, causing a smirk to appear on Issei's face. I'm curious what you would ask of me, but I must decline the offer. He commented she, and then approached at full speed, giving her a quick sword swing that Tiamat dodged with great happiness, ducking his body. It doesn't matter that I don't even have 1% of your power. He exclaimed, throwing another swing that was dodged again. I will never stop believing in myself. He concluded, making sparks fly into the air as his swords clashed a few times. 
Finally, Issei jumped back, then charged with all his might, making the swords generate a great sound impact. The generated shock wave forced Penemu and Rossweiss to lightly cover their faces from the snow that was thrown out. While Issei continued to struggle as hard as he could to break through Tiamat's defenses, the dragon simply lay in place. Undeterred, smiling cheekily at him. You still have a million years to catch up with me. I will not give up. I'm sorry, but I can't understand the philosophy of the weak. Tiamat finished off the outburst of words, sending Issei flying when she used a bit of her strength. As soon as she took that action, the dragon raised her hand, causing a large column of ice to rush towards her target. Issei got to see this in time, so he quickly spread his wings and brought his katana forward, blocking the attack, but he couldn't help but be dragged away by the force of the pillar. Thanks to his wings, Issei was able to get out of the range of the attack. Very predictable, she exclaimed the dragon, placing her hand on the ground, causing a large number of ice pillars to grow from the ground causing Issei to widen his eyes in shock. Issei blocked the first pillar with his katana, then slipped over it and miraculously dodged the next attack. He quickly jumped off the ice, hurtling towards the ground as he spun around with his katana outstretched. Another ice pillar crossed his path, but it was shattered when he came into contact with the chestnut tree. The icy debris obscured Issei's vision, so he didn't see as Tiamat appeared in front of him parrying her spinning attack with one hand, generating a huge roar. Issei's eyes couldn't help but widen when she saw that she had stopped him by grabbing the edge of her katana. Unfortunately, she didn't have time to react and was sent flying when he received a strong downward kick to her armor that caused her to spit up blood. The blow to his abdomen had been very forceful, causing the armor to take a large amount of damage. Issei descended to the ground at full speed, causing his two spectators to take cover as a large cloud of dust and snow flew out in all directions, along with a huge tremor that lasted for a second. A small smile appeared on Tiamat's face as she raised both of her hands to the sky, creating a magic circle of worrying dimensions. Ice Meteoroid, a huge rock about 20 meters in diameter made of ice began to emerge from the magic circle, causing Penemu and Rossweiss's eyes to widen in shock. They both jumped back, watching as the huge boulder plummeted to the ground. That's already too much, Penemu thought, frowning noticeably. The object hit the ground, causing both of them to take cover from the huge blizzard and the excessive amount of dust and snow that was shot towards them, even though they were at a safe distance. The ground trembled for a few seconds, making Penemu slightly grit her teeth. After the dust had disappeared, it left a rather peculiar scene to behold, for around the huge rock of ice there was no more snow, only broken and cracked ground. Tiamat parked a few meters from the attack, watching with great concern. Maybe I exaggerated a bit. She wondered with great sorrow. You should see how he is. She concluded herself, thinking of running to Issei. When he barely took a step, she stopped dead, her gaze flashing a slight amount of surprise. After a few seconds, the ice began to slowly crack, until the center broke into a thousand pieces, releasing Issei who had his katana extended to the sky. Still, it didn't look good at all. Her armor was completely cracked, at the same time that some blood ran through said holes. Issei dematerialized his helmet, where a large bloodstain ran across half of her face. She quickly dropped to her knees, pinning her to the ground as she gasped. At all times she kept her gaze lowered, making sure they couldn't see her eyes. He didn't break it completely. It's impressive that he managed to break it though. She thought with a small smile, but that expression didn't last long when she saw the somewhat battered condition of her future lover. After pondering for a short second, Tiamat began to move forward with great concern on her face. I think we should stop it for today, he commented. Although it took me a million years, Issei clenched his katana tightly causing the dragon to stop dead, looking at him in slight surprise. Even though I need to break my limits a million times, reddish waves began to emanate from Issei's body, generating a small tremor around him, making Tiamat look at him with great attention, as did his two spectators. Even if it takes a million evolutions to reach you, the reddish ripples transformed into a strong crimson aura as red as blood that completely surrounded his body. Whatever it takes, he continued, slowly getting to his feet as he unearthed his katana, making the aura feel even more intense and suffocating. Issei looked up, seeing that his eyes were covered in a green aura. I'll catch you, 
he yelled as he violently swung his katana forward, causing Crimson Aura to spread across the entire battlefield, generating a large burst of energy. Explosion. Diedrag's shout was heard even louder than the huge air current produced by the maximum power emanating from the balance breaker. Finally the interesting thing begins. Tiamat commented with a slightly excited smile, slightly covering her face from the huge blizzard that was accompanied by that crimson aura. I'll show you that I can narrow that gap between us a lot faster than you think. He commented the brunette as he went into a combat pose, materializing his helmet. The only one who decides that, is me. Tiamat replied, while his hair waved freely, giving him a beautiful appearance. Issei leapt forward, creating massive destruction where he was previously standing. It's gotten a little faster. Tiamat thought as he swung his sword, preparing for the clash. The clash between the two beings occurred in just one second, generating a huge shock wave. The tremor was as strong as the sound of the impact. The curtain of dust that had been generated failed to cover the huge crater that had appeared below them. As the cloud of dust was slowly disappearing, it could be seen that both of them were wide-eyed. Something strange, since Tiamat was not usually surprised in this way in combat. It's enough. Penemu's cutting voice made them both sweat. The Kadri was in the middle of both attacks. She was blocking Tiamat's sword with his katana, while holding Issei's weapon with her other hand. Just with his hand, Issei thought, completely paralyzed by what he witnessed. I told you it would be easy. Penemu declared, giving Issei a look. Remember this feeling well, it's not just your strength that enables this state, it depends on your emotions. The Kadri explained, causing both of them to lower their swords and take a few steps back. The same goes for your balance breaker evolutions. The brown haired man couldn't help but look at her with great attention at her last words. But sacred gear evolutions aren't that simple. I'll tell you all about it when we focus on breaking your limits. Issei simply nodded, looking at his hands in complete satisfaction as he felt the immense amount of power coursing through his body. Hey, Issei, Tiamat's comment gained the brunette's attention. Why do you want to protect me? The dragon asked, causing Issei to flinch at the sudden question. That's what you told me when we made the bet, but I've already proven to perfection that I can hold my own. So, Tiamat couldn't help but tilt her head to the side, displaying a great deal of tenderness. Because, Issei couldn't help but smile at the question. Over time, I realized that I don't just want to protect. I want to be just as strong as you to fight shoulder to shoulder when. We need each other the most. I always want to be able to support you when you need it. The chestnut's words slightly surprised Tiamat. With my current power, I'm just a nuisance to you and Penemu. I want to become stronger to protect and be protected. It annoys me so much that it's so one-sided. Hearing her explanation, both Penemu and Tiamat looked at each other, causing Issei to rub his hair in embarrassment as both women seemed to chuckle slightly. I know it's a bit absurd, but, we understand, the dragon commented, and we really appreciate that you want to defend us, just like we do with you. Penemu finished Tiamat's idea, causing Issei to give them a toothy grin. But, since we're being so honest, the dragon commented, unable to help but smile. You will need a miracle to become as strong as me. The dragon affirmed, making Issei smile with great confidence. I don't know if you remember, but I am a walking miracle. He commented on the brunette, pointing to himself. After all, out of the vast number of millions of humans, I was chosen as the bearer of Diedrake. You're right about that, the dragon commented, approaching him. You are even capable of leaving miracles in your path. Just as she was about to ask what she meant, Issei's cheeks flushed red as Tiamat leaned down a little to kiss his forehead. After all, you made all my pain go away, she concluded, her eyes shining with great love and affection, making Issei feel even more at ease when her foreheads collided with each other. Penemu just watched them, unable to help but smile at the emotional moment. Rosweiss arrived quickly, seeing Issei's body. Hum, this is not good, he thought aloud with great concern, earning the attention of all three. They are not serious injuries, but his body is badly hurt. That's true. Tiamat rolled her eyes as he sensed a menacing aura behind him. I told you not to overdo it, dragon. When he didn't say his name, Tiamat automatically knew that he was in trouble. But, you told me not to be afraid, he commented with a slight drop of sweat as he opted for a nonchalant expression, looking away. 
Tiamat's eyes rolled back as Penemu grabbed her head tightly. The Kadri's murderous, glowing red eyes peered over his right shoulder, while a terrifying black aura surrounded his entire face, and let's just say that his usual imperturbable expression had become very scary. For the first time in her life, Tiamat felt intimidated, if only a little. You're lucky your ice healing factor can heal him. Those were Penemu's only words, making Tiamat look even more in the other direction with a poker face. Still, my healing factor isn't very good. She commented the dragon, giving a small inward sigh as Penemu pulled away from her. I think that, taking into account the dinner and the nap, I will be able to finish healing him only in the morning of the next day. She explained, causing Penemu to pat her face. I guess it doesn't matter much. Finally the Kadri said, uncovering her face. I think they can control it for a while, just because Loki will be very weak. But, today's training, the brown-haired question, slightly discouraged, receiving a shake of the head from Penemu. We could also use a rest day before the fight, so this isn't really a setback, declared the Kadri. Then you'd better start now, the dragon commented, sitting down on one of the many rubble on the battlefield. Come here, she commented herself, patting her legs a couple of times. A yes, Issei quickly nodded, removing his balance breaker, then sitting on her lap. He closed his eyes deeply as Tiamat placed both of her hands on his head. The dragon began to hum as her hands became covered in ice particles. Issei couldn't help but shudder as the cold ran through his head, but he quickly felt the pain in his head disappear. In fact, said pain was transformed into something extremely relaxing. Perhaps it was due to the fact that she was caressing him to heal him. I didn't think it would feel so good, Issei thought with a small smile. We'd better leave them for now, commented Penemu, looking at Rossweiss. Uh, aren't you staying with them? Rossweiss asked, receiving a negative from the cadre. I would like to see your training today. I want to know how the Valkyrie Queens train. Ross simply nodded, preparing a magic circle. Actually, this training is not a training. It's just for you to learn how to act like a royal queen during a royal wedding. Ross explained, making Penemu slightly surprised. I didn't know that the Valkyrie Queens had a royal wedding, since the Asgardian gods are the only ones that have them. The Kadri commented, wanting to find out more about the subject. Well, it's not like I'm having a royal wedding. I don't have a fiancé in the first place. It's just a practice, because that's what Asgardian law says nowadays. The Valkyrie explained, causing Penemu to narrow her eyes. She's lying, although I don't know where, she thought though she decided not to probe any further, since she should have her reasons for lying to him. The next day, get ready, Odin declared, feeling how his final forces were about to collapse. Behind him, was a huge army of devils, angels, and fallen angels. I hope this ends quickly, Barakiel thought with a small internal sigh. It's a shame that my cousin gets the main fun, a very muscular man thought, who couldn't help but look at Rius with his arms crossed. Sirzex and Azazel were also in that place, with the difference that the Kadri was next to Odin along with Rias, Sona and their respective entourages. With the exception of Issei of course. The silence of the meeting was quickly interrupted when a subject entered the room, opening the doors of the mansion with a loud bang, drawing everyone's attention. Lord Sirzex, a large army of monsters is rapidly approaching the city from the other end. The man exclaimed, making Sirzex smile. Apparently, Loki mobilized all his experiments at the decisive moment. I must say that he calculated it quite well. The Demon King commented, before looking at the entire Grand Army. Let's not let the city be affected like last time. This time, we will stop them and not allow any life to be wasted in vain. Sirzex concluded his speech, receiving a nod from almost all of the warriors. A few seconds later, a huge magic circle appeared at everyone's feet causing them to disappear from one moment to the next. Ross will be with me in a moment, Odin declared, gaining the attention of Azazel and the others that were left. If things don't go as planned, I'll tell him to take care of Loki. He explained himself, making Rias take a step forward. Don't worry, we'll stop him, Rias declared, receiving a nod from the old man, who was sweating even more than before. Go to your positions, declared the god, receiving a nod from all the teenagers. You stay a moment, he clarified, causing Azazel to look at him with a raised eyebrow. 
What do you want, old man? He asked himself as he crossed his arms, earning a small laugh from the god due to his nickname. As the Sears ex brat said, Loki always plans things well before acting. It's most likely not as easy as it sounds. The god declared, making Azazel a little serious. Although, we have a great advantage. These last words made the Kadri raise an eyebrow. No information has leaked about the first meeting between the factions. It is known that there was a big battle, but Issei's performance was never specified, so Loki must not. Be aware of everything that has improved until now. Moment. Odin commented, making Azazel understand what he meant. So, you only agreed to our plan not only because Loki would be too weak, but you also did it so that Issei's true power begins to be known properly, or am I wrong? The Kadri asked, causing Odin to look sideways at him. I don't like Sirzex trying to hide his achievements so much. He must be known for what he really is. The god spoke, causing Azazel to turn around. Yeah, I don't really like the king taking all the achievements in his entourage either, but let's just say the devils have their own monarchy. He concluded, shrugging his shoulders to downplay the matter. I'll go prepare the magical barrier. I don't think it's necessary, since your son is too proud to run away. But, one never knows. Azazel raised both hands to emphasize his last words as he left. It never hurts to take certain precautions. The god commented to himself, seeing how all the magic circles were about to break. Azazel arrived at the battlefield, seeing how Rias, Sona, and everyone else were already on the battlefield. Saji got new soul parts from Vitra. Rias asked with slight surprise. We have another one, Sona whispered in her ear. But we don't want to use it, as it might be a problem. We suspect that Vitra's consciousness might wake up and make the demonic corruption stop working properly because of it. The student council president explained, making Rias nod in understanding. It can be very difficult to deal with people like that. Gasper and Issei are a huge pain in the ass sometimes. She cleared the redhead. What are you doing here, Gasper? Azazel asked, seeing that the half-vampire was at the top of the canyon with him, instead of with his companions. The president said to stay here. Gasper clarified somewhat discouraged. I still have a long way to go to control my power and he is afraid that I will hurt my companions again because of it. I suppose she's right, but if she thought more, I'm sure she could come up with better solutions. Azazel declared, making Gasper look at him with some respect at his words. For now, you'd better stay here. Defying your mistress's rules would mean nothing good for you. And even if I tried to prevent you from being punished, I don't have enough jurisdiction to counter those facts. He concluded the cadre, receiving a quick nod from Gasper. Are they in position? Odin asked through a small magic circle. Release it whenever you want. Azazel replied with a small nod. Very good, he commented, leaving a couple of seconds in great suspense. Ellipsis, ellipsis, there it goes. The god yelled with a very forced voice, causing all the magic circles to break into a thousand pieces, alerting Rias and the others. Azazel gritted his teeth tightly and spread his hands out to the sides, creating a huge magical barrier along the entire length of the canyon. The barrier was so huge that it impressed Gasper, since seeing how it generated until it closed into a huge dome was very striking. I don't know how long I can last like this, this requires a lot of energy, Azazel thought with a rather forced smile on his face. It would have been good for me to finish the development of my precious sacred gear. Rias and the others slowly approached the deepest part of the canyon, seeing how Loki was on his knees, breathing heavily. I knew it would be hard, but that old man, the god thought, getting up slowly as a large amount of sweat broke out on his face. You'd better give up now, Loki. Sona clarified, adjusting her glasses. We know how strong you are, but in your current condition you can't do anything. The sea tree explained, causing a proud smile to appear on the god, who then laughed out loud. The young, people simply looked at each other, not understanding what was so funny. Finally, the god stopped laughing from one second to the next, fixing a penetrating and somewhat macabre gaze on Sona. Do you think those words are capable of intimidating me? The god questioned with a gloomy voice, causing more than one to start sweating. And besides, there's not even the security. I guess you guys want to suffer a lot, right? He asked himself, looking at everyone. He is not here, but my servant will come soon. Rias clarified, 
making Loki smile as he tried to keep up appearances. Huh, that's good to know. The god clarified, then narrowed his eyes when his vision became very blurry. I said all that, but I'm really screwed, he thought, cupping his face. I spent a large amount of magic to damage the seals, and now I can barely stay conscious. Not to mention, my body is much more vulnerable because of it. Loki analyzed the situation for a short second, seeing how everyone was starting to surround him from above, activating their sacred gears. The serious expression of the god turned into a smile from one second to the next. I guess I'll have to use that from the start, he concluded, then resting one of his hands on the ground, impressing everyone immensely as numerous very large magic circles began to spring up around them. Damn it, he prepared those summons in advance, Azazel stated through gritted teeth, knowing what those monsters probably were. Suddenly, the tables of the fight changed drastically when the huge wolf Fenrir appeared with his two sons, completely surrounding them. In the center of them, Loki emerged riding atop a huge snake. Let's see if they can fight my children, he declared Loki with a smirk on his face, as he watched as they all quickly fell back, protecting their backs. This can be a bit tricky, Kiba commented, looking at the huge enemies they were about to face. Of course, Akino clarified with a small smile. These little friends are much stronger compared to the 12 gates of hell gatekeepers that Kokobil sent us. Fine, Rias declared with a small smile. I still can't perfectly control my power of destruction, so we just have to hold on and combine our skills, he concluded, watching as the huge wolves slowly approached, while the snake moved away from them, leaving Loki to a safe distance. Just in case, my body had better continue to be in perfect condition. The god thought with great seriousness. I don't want to trust the security. I must bring him with me at all costs. He concluded, implying that his plan went beyond killing him, unlike what everyone believed. Meanwhile, in Asgard, Tiamat was doing a kind of leg massage to the chestnut, who saw how the ice on his legs was closing the last wounds. Ready, she exclaimed the dragon with a small smile. Issei got up from the bed, doing a couple of stretches. I don't feel any discomfort. She clarified her with a smile. I think we should get going now. She clarified, seeing how Penemu was leaning on the door. Not yet, we must change those clothes for you. She clarified herself, watching as the last garment from the Brown Academy was in tatters. My clothes. He questioned the brunette, looking down at himself. I do not think that it's necessary. You should stop wearing your academy clothes for everything. Penemu clarified, bringing him a box that she had in her hands. Put this on, she concluded, watching as Issei took out a black muscle shirt, raising an eyebrow. Is it good clothing for battles? She asked herself, receiving a quick nod from Tiamat and Penemu. Okay, I'll put it on in the bathroom. She finished, leaving both women alone. Tiamat and Penemu looked at each other seriously. After a few seconds, they both began to have a small blush on their faces, which intensified more and more. And she's not only good for battles, they both thought at the same time, remembering the clothes they had bought for her. After a few seconds, the three of them left the room and were met by Rossweiss, who greeted them with a smile and sent them to the castle gates. Issei had the balance breaker activated, so you couldn't see the new clothes he was wearing on top of him. Issei wondered why they hadn't just teleported right there, receiving the answer almost instantly. At the door there were about three Valkyries who were waiting for Issei with different gifts, since they had been happy to be able to live with a man like him in training. Tiamat taunted him saying that he had his first fans, something Issei only received with a small laugh. Things got even stranger when Ross opened the castle doors, denoting how a huge line seemed to want to say goodbye to Issei and the two women who accompanied him. The brunette nearly lost his jaw at the sight, while Penemu and Tiamat raised their eyebrows, as they didn't expect Issei to have managed to gain so much fame in Asgard in just a week. Hum, this will take a while, Issei thought with his eyes rolling. I'll go ahead to find out how things are going, Ross clarified, saying goodbye to the trio. Twenty minutes later, careful, Rias will receive Asia's shout, dodging Fenrir just in time, who was inches away from splitting her in half. Curse, she thought the redhead as she flew. They've barely done us any harm, but we haven't managed to do much either. This last thought only made him clench his teeth even harder. Akino looked to her side, 
Seeing that Sona's entourage had been able to knock out the two sons of Fenrir, but they had a lot of trouble with the snake. Mainly because Saji and Tsubaki were completely exhausted. The snake made a quick movement with its tail, managing to hit everyone nearby, sending them to where Rias and the others were. Sona and her entire entourage rolled on the ground, then got up with great difficulty, since their bodies had suffered a large number of injuries from the harsh and rapid attack. This is bad, they have us cornered again, and we have almost no energy anymore. She would declare the sea tree, watching as Fenrir got closer to them, just like the snake. This is already done, Loki would think with a smile, while he lay sitting on a stone. But, I should stop the attack now. The god couldn't help but get serious at his last thought. There's no need to kill any of them for now. Especially the one that belongs to the Grimori caste, he would conclude, fixing his gaze on Rias. At the very least, he shouldn't die for now. Hi. Just as Loki was about to give orders to his creatures, he couldn't help but raise an eyebrow as all the monsters were imprisoned by magical barriers. Don't stand there, Azazel yelled, causing everyone to react. Go after Loki. Rias and the others watched this in complete shock, but quickly took the opportunity to get out of the creature's range, quickly approaching where the god was located. Apparently, there is a hidden rat, the god would think after what he witnessed, looking from one side to the other, trying to find something or someone. The incredible thing about it all is that he was still sitting very calmly, indicating that the fact did not bother him in the least. Loki, Rias yelled, coming a few meters from him, along with the others. Don't even think about it, it's a waste of time. The god explained, making everyone stop their advance dead. I've managed to recover a bit of my strength, while a large number of you are heavily damaged and mentally exhausted from excessive magic consumption. He explained in detail, then looked at them with great boredom. In short, they have nothing to do against me. He concluded, causing some to take a step back, while others gritted their teeth. Should I break this barrier already? The god thought, seeing the enormous barrier that held him back. From what I know, Azazel must be very tired by now. He would fold his hands under her chin, closing his eyes as he thought carefully. But that would require more use of my magic. I don't think it's good, since I don't want to use that yet, he concluded. Rias, what do you propose? Sona asked while holding her severely injured shoulder. Damn, was all the redhead said, gritting her teeth. The look of both women quickly changed to one of complete surprise, taking their gaze to the sky. Loki himself put his carefree and serious posture aside, raising his face to the sky while slightly gritting his teeth. Azazel also looked up in astonishment, only to fall back as his barrier broke from a great surge of power. Someone comes, he exclaimed she, while looking at the sky. That energy, Loki commented, standing up. It's an ultimate class devil, Azazel thought pulling himself together. Does that mean that Sirzex has already defeated those attacking the city? It can't be, they should be there for at least another five minutes, Loki thought, ruling out the possibility that it was Sirzex. It began to be seen slowly as a silhouette approached at a good speed. Quickly, the mouths of more than one opened when he saw that it was Issei, who was equipped with his balance breaker. Issei quickly descended and landed, spawning a small line of destruction in his path until he finally stopped right in front of Loki. It's Issei. Gasper clenched his fists tightly as the brunette took off his balance breaker, looking at the god with a rather subjective smile. Many of the women instantly blushed upon seeing Issei's outfit, as he was wearing black pants that were a bit tight on his well-toned legs, while the tight-fitting black tank top showed off every inch of him perfectly, his muscles well-defined and without a hint of fat. It is true that he was thin, and perhaps for that very reason is that his notorious and not exaggerated muscular figure made him look very appealing in the eyes of the ladies. You finally introduce yourself, Hyodo Issei. Loki declared with great glee, unable to take his eyes off her. Get out of here, I'll take care of it from now on. Issei's words were more than forceful. Certain people didn't like being ordered around, but they still didn't say anything about it, since there was nothing to discuss right now. They all left quickly, leaving only the chestnut and the god. A small laugh was heard from a hidden place among the rocks. Now that the barrier is gone, it's time to go. Her feline eyes would be displayed in the dark, hinting that it was Kuroka. I'd like to see how Hyodo fare, but I don't want to risk being found out. 
Loki just watched with a click of the tongue as all his creatures disappeared in a magic circle, leaving him completely alone against the brunette. Damn, he said quietly, though he quickly brushed it off. After all, he had something much more important right in front of him. Odin arrived with Ross to see the outcome of the battle. Azazel couldn't help but laugh at the old man, as he was being carried by the Valkyrie. That laughter did not last long, as Penemu and Tiamat quickly joined them, looking intently at the battlefield. Let's see the result of his internship in Asgard, the Kadri declared with much intrigue and emission, since he wanted to see the progress of the brat. He has gained a large number of fans. Penemu clarified, making Gasper look at her with great intrigue. Let me guess, it was the single Valkyries. Right, Odin asked with great grace, since he knew his own warriors well, and they were very easily moved. Loki stared at him for several seconds, making Issei raise an eyebrow. Do I have something on my face? The chestnut asked, pointing to himself. I just think that the devils were very clever. The god replied, causing Issei to raise the other eyebrow of him. To try to avoid their extinction, they decided to change the fate with the help of the one who advocated the most during the battle against Trihexa. These words made Issei slightly widen his eyes. This bastard, she thought through slightly gritted teeth. How the hell do they know about the prophecy? You must wake up now, before you doom us all, declared the god, to then raise his hand to the front, slightly impressing the brunette. Ragnarok must not be attempted to be changed under any circumstances. It will only bring chaos and destruction to all, except for those selfish who manipulate it in their favor. Loki clarified, narrowing his eyes slightly. You are the pillar that guides us to the correct future. God made a big mistake in prophesying and transmitting his word, but I will make sure that everything continues as normal. He concluded, don't worry, I know what the spread of this prophecy could mean, and for that very reason, I won't say anything about it. Odin's eyes fluttered in disbelief at what they were seeing. Are you reaching out to him? She wondered to herself, unable to believe what she was witnessing. Are they having a talk? Is that so weird? He questioned Rias, who had just arrived along with everyone else. You do not get it. She commented herself, making her face more serious than usual. Loki never reasons with anyone. I ask you politely to come with me. Loki finished, making Issei raise an eyebrow. Are you asking me to give up the demons? He asked her materializing her katana. That's how it is, Loki nodded, and if I do not want. She asked her as he played with his katana. Loki's eyes became extremely serious. Then, I will drag you with me and forcefully make you see the truth. Loki disappeared, generating a large flash and a small blizzard that blew up in various directions. Loki watched with slight surprise as Issei had activated his balance breaker, and had stopped his punch that was aimed at his back with his katana. Issei turned his face, glancing sideways at the god as he dematerialized his helmet, giving him a small smile. If you were in good condition, I'm sure you would have knocked me unconscious with that attack. He lightened the brown hair, making Loki grit his teeth slightly. Loki took a huge leap back, taking some distance for safety's sake. Issei just turned around very calmly while looking at his katana. I guess I won't need this to defeat you in your current condition. He deduced she inserting the katana into a magic circle. He just activated his balance breaker and he already has that power. The god thought, narrowing his eyes. There is something that does not fit with what was investigated. Aren't you going to attack? Issei asked, then smiled. In that case, Loki gritted his teeth as a crimson flash landed in front of him, being Issei who moved at quite astonishing speed. All go, he exclaimed, giving him a big kick to the knee that destabilized him then giving him a hard blow to the cheek with his forearm that generated a loud noise, causing Loki to spit out a large amount of saliva. Loki was stunned for a short second by such a blow, taking a step back. The god quickly recovered and tried to punch Issei in the face, who simply caught the attack with one of his hands, then gave him a strong upward kick to the chin that generated another loud noise, causing Loki to spit out a bit of blood. Taking advantage of the fact that the god had not recovered from the blow, Issei quickly continued with his attack, giving him a strong knee to the abdomen that generated a great tremor, causing Loki to vomit blood. Issei took a couple of steps back, watching how Loki writhed in pain from the last attack he delivered. I didn't think the attrition and damage to break the barrier would be so great. 
he thought the chestnut, talking to his tenant. This is not being fun at all, he concluded, unable to help but put on a slightly bored look. Breaking through a barrier as strong as Odin's must have reduced his magical reserves to near zero, explained the dragon. As a consequence, his defenses are ridiculously low and he suffers from an agonizing headache. It's a miracle that he can still stand after the first blow you landed on him. Diedrag concluded, genuinely impressed at the god's tenacity. Issei could simply observe this with slight surprise, since he didn't know all the consequences that excessive consumption of magic could bring. Loki took a deep breath and clenched his fists tightly, trying to compose himself as well as possible. In that case, he's a great warrior, the brown-haired man thought, having some respect for the god. Loki quickly launched himself against Issei, trying to punch him that the brunette easily dodged, moving his body to the side at surprising speed. No doubt, his power is greater than when he fought against Kokobil. The god thought, as he tried to land another blow, only to be stopped when Issei blocked it with his X-crossed forearms. I don't know how much he can control his balance breaker now, but it's not like he wasn't prepared for this. He concluded, narrowing his eyes slightly as he tried to kick him, which Issei blocked again without any difficulty when he caught his foot in his hand. In a short time, a great rain of punches and kicks began to be thrown at Issei, who did not move an inch from his place as he blocked all attacks with only the movements of his arms, demonstrating the great control and precision he had obtained over her body. Ah, Loki yelled loudly as his fist was covered in a thin layer of magic, which Issei was able to stop without any difficulty. Being a stronger attack than normal, a large burst shot out in various directions, adding to the intense blow that lasted for a second from the use of magic. This time, Issei didn't let go of his hand and brought him closer to him, to then give him a strong blow to the abdomen. This time, Issei had used all of his strength, so his fist sank a little into Loki's abdomen, causing the god to double over and spit out a large amount of blood as he trembled in pain. Issei moved quickly behind him, giving him a hard blow to the back that forced him upright again. That didn't end there, since Issei took advantage of his position to give him a strong kick to the face that deformed him for a short second. Loki staggered before steadying himself, watching as Issei's blurry figure levitated a few feet away from him. The god could only observe how he received a strong kick to the chin that sent him crawling along the ground for a couple of meters, and then he was lying on the ground. Issei simply stayed in his position, returning to the ground as he watched the god with a raised eyebrow. Was that all? A few seconds passed in which Loki didn't even move from the ground, but he quickly began to feel a somewhat strange energy that alerted Issei, and everyone who was there. That energy, Issei thought, looking at Loki intently. Asterisk it's the energy of Ophis Ouroboros. Diedrag explained with great seriousness. Asterisk apparently, this subject was in contact with her, and gave her a small part of his power. The dragon concluded, watching carefully as Loki began to rise slowly from the ground while a rather corrosive violet aura began to emanate from him, her body. When he turned around, Issei could make out how the image of a purple snake was in his hand. It was a kind of seal, where Issei instantly deduced that this is where the power came from. I knew things were going to get complicated. The god commented, slowly approaching Issei as her body regenerated at an astonishing speed. I only have five minutes, but it's more than enough, he concluded, making Issei smile at him. Diedrag, his magic, the chestnut asked, looking closely at his enemy. Asterisk Ophis's magic and power only heals wounds and grants some power to the user it won't have a magical regeneration. Even so, the power granted through the seals is always by magic. I don't think it has recovered much, but it will be a problem if we take it lightly. The dragon explained, feeling the density and amount of power that Ophis's essence emanated. Luckily, Ophis isn't such an airhead to lend an amount of power that would cause real trouble. She thought the dragon, remembering the few times he had crossed paths with Ophis, since the dragon had always been very carefree and she never thought things twice. That woman, the dragon thought with a small smile. Her lack of fear and empathy of hers always caused her to make decisions without thinking about the consequences. 12, 13, 14, Issei kept counting in his head as he watched Loki slowly approaching, until the god disappeared out of nowhere, making Issei widen his eyes in shock. The brunette managed to cover himself just in time when Loki appeared in front of him, delivering a big kick to his ribs. 
When the blow made contact with his forearm, a small crater was created at his feet and a huge amount of small debris flew everywhere, being carried away by the small shock wave that had been generated. Issei's eyes widened even more when she felt his armor break slightly, as did the block. From one second to the next, Issei was thrown at great speed towards a huge mound accompanied by a sharp sound caused by the blow, generating a small explosion when it collided and collapsed the natural pillar. Loki carefully observed how Issei had been buried under the rubble, so he decided to approach slowly. That punch isn't even kidding enough. The god thought seriously, then stopped dead when a huge magic circle appeared in the sky. It just can't be. He yelled the god with his eyes wide open when he saw how Thor's huge hammer fell a few meters from Issei, generating a huge tremor, sinking slightly on the battlefield. Loki uncovered his face, looking at the hammer in great disbelief. How did my stupid brother deign to meddle in this? The god thought, since he knew perfectly well what Thor was like, and he was not the type of man who would intervene in a conflict if it did not bring him a personal benefit. Before he could find a possible answer to that fact, he was able to watch as Issei dashed out of the rubble, leaving a flash of crimson in his wake. The brunette quickly took the hammer with both hands, lifting it with slight difficulty. In the end, he did keep his word. Rossweiss thought with slight surprise, seeing how everything was happening. I didn't know Thor's hammer could be so heavy. He stated the brunette, putting her on his back, causing a small tremor to go through the entire place. The problem isn't the hammer, but its powers. Loki thought with a slight sweat as he kept a prudent distance. Lightning bolts contain an absurd amount of power. If I get hit by even a few of those in my current condition, I'm out. He concluded, moving slowly as he prepared for Issei to start spewing the bolts. I just have to wait until he doesn't know how to use it correctly. Issei lightly waved the hammer, watching as a large amount of lightning began to emanate from it. The brunette couldn't help but watch this with slight curiosity, but he quickly shrugged. Issei looked towards where the spectators were, to then do something that few expected. Everyone's eyes widened in shock as Issei tossed the hammer at their feet, making a huge crash as it fell. But what are you thinking? Sona questioned in great disbelief. He wants to defeat him with his own power. Azazel declared, managing to gain everyone's attention. He thinks he can do it. And to be honest, I think so too. He explained the cadre with a smile that showed his great interest in the decision shown by the chestnut. A dragon's pride can sometimes be a contentious thing. Tiamat thought with a serious expression. You better know when to stop that pride, he concluded, looking closely at Issei. The chestnut would land a few meters from Loki while watching him with a small smile. The god just looked at him unfazed by his earlier action as he crossed his arms. I'm surprised what you've done. She stated, I don't need more power than my own to defeat you. It was the brown-haired simple response, seeing how Loki gave him a somewhat Machiavellian smile after his words. I don't know if it's honorable or stupid. The god answered him, only to watch how Issei rushed towards him with a jump. Issei extended his fist with the idea of giving him a strong blow to the face, being dodged by Loki when he moved at enormous speed to the side. The god tried to counterattack instantly getting a little surprise when the brown-haired man managed to parry his blow with a good forearm block. From one second to the next, Issei began to lash out a large number of punches at high speed, being completely blocked and dodged by Loki. The attacks were so fast and forceful that they generated a constant tiny tremor, while both figures began to rise into the air due to the inveterate fight they were having. On certain occasions, Loki tried to counterattack with a quick punch, being dodged by Issei with great difficulty and his somewhat clumsy movements when he dodged were proof of this. Loki only increased his smile even more when he placed his shoulder to resist all of Issei's blows, feeling that they barely bothered him a bit. The god unleashed a sudden slashing kick, narrowly dodged by Issei as she flexed her back, then quickly countered with a somersault kick. Loki moved at high speed again, dodging the attack with no problem. Issei watched as the somewhat blurred figure of the god moved away between the rocky mounds, following its movements quickly. Loki smiled at this, doing a somersault towards a mound, standing on the stone, then using it as momentum to go at full speed against the chestnut tree, completely destroying the rock pillar. Issei could only widen his eyes in shock, since he didn't predict that movement, and since he was looking for him, he didn't have enough time to respond. Therefore, 
she received a huge punch below her chin that caused a momentary tremor. The armor cracked slightly, while Issei spat out a small amount of blood and flew into the air due to the inertia of such a blow. Luckily, Issei was able to compose himself quickly, so he ducked out of pure instinct, dodging an elbow from Loki, who was already behind him to surprise him again. Issei tried to respond quickly with an upward kick, being dodged again by the god when he tilted his head back, laughing slightly at his rival's, slow, attempts. The god was quickly chased by Issei as he rose higher into the air, attempting to land a couple of kicks to his face. Loki meticulously dodged all of his attacks, demonstrating zero difficulty in doing so. Another barrage of punches came again from Issei as they continued to rise up, this time combining the combo with different kicks. Where all the attempts were frustrated when Loki blocked them or simply dodged them. I admit that you surprised me a bit, Loki commented, as he continued to block the attacks. You're a little stronger than I expected, but, Loki increased his smile even more, counterattacking with a punch that hit the target, where it quickly turned into endless blows that fell on the chestnut. It's just a little, he finished, giving him a large downward kick to the abdomen that sent him straight to the ground at enormous speed, generating a small explosion as he crashed, sending a couple of pieces of debris flying, in addition to the small cloud of dust that had been generated. Loki simply stared from the sky with his smile still in force, seeing how the cloud of dust did not show any strange movement. The only thing that he could distinguish was how certain green glows blinked at a great speed. After a few seconds, Issei flew out of the dust curtain at great speed, leaving a reddish trail in his wake. Loki's smile disappeared completely and his eyes widened in complete surprise as Issei's speed seemed to have doubled. Not being prepared for such an overwhelming change, Loki received a strong blow to the cheek that made him spit out a little blood and forced him to turn his face due to inertia. Issei didn't stop and continued to punch him endlessly in the face while Loki still looked dazed, causing the god to back up slowly as small shock waves were present in the place. Issei stopped for a short second, only to kick him hard in the chin, sending Loki flying aimlessly. Issei didn't plan on ending the sequence of attacks, so he quickly followed at enormous speed. Just when he was going to give him a double kick in the back, it could be seen how Loki opened his eyes and reacted just in time, taking him by both legs and then pulling him closer and giving him a big elbow in the forehead, making the helmet come off. Broke slightly. The force of the impact was such that it momentarily stunned Issei, which Loki took advantage of, delivering a strong punch to the helmet that ended up breaking it, and then hitting him hard with the head, causing Issei to give a small cry of pain when his nose ejected blood. The headbutt was so strong that it destabilized Issei, which Loki took advantage of, punching him in the face with all his strength, generating a loud noise and making Issei spit out a large amount of blood. The blow was so strong that the chestnut was directed towards the ground again, but he was able to compose himself before falling, materializing his helmet again. Before he could see where Loki was, his eyes widened in shock as he received a large blow to his back, sending him flying straight into a rock pillar rolling onto the structure from the forced fall. Just when he was able to steady himself, she managed to watch as Loki had his hand outstretched as a notoriously bright and slightly large magic circle loomed in front of him. The magical attack was quickly fired, causing Issei to clench his teeth slightly. He spread his wings and leapt high, miraculously dodging the first attack, only to blink in disbelief when he saw yet another headed his way, sending up a huge explosion of smoke that shook the entire battlefield sending up a storm, huge current of wind that forced all spectators to take cover. That hit must have left him pretty bad, the god thought with a smirk on his face. As the smoke slowly began to clear away, Loki couldn't help but be awed at the sight. Did he dodge it? He wondered, seeing that Issei had one of his arms raised, while a large amount of his armor near that sector had been completely destroyed. Revealing his clothing in tatters. That was close. Issei thought aloud as she rubbed her exposed cheek, as half of her helmet had ended up shattered. Enough of games, the god declared, crossing his arms. You can almost dodge this attack, that's true. The god commented, narrowing his eyes. But, that attack is far from being the most powerful, and I wouldn't want to kill you. The god concluded, making Issei smile at him. Without saying a word, Issei regenerated his armor and clenched his fists tightly causing a whirlwind of reddish power to rise into the air, impressing the god. Boost, 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 
boost 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 to oh 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 the last surge created even more turmoil which quickly died down to nothing as the reddish blizzard suddenly stopped only a thin crimson aura surrounding the chestnut being left loki slowly uncovered his face completely shocked at what he had witnessed what the hell was that the god thought seeing how the enormous energy expelled by the chestnut tree had suddenly disappeared. What he didn't know, was that that energy had been contained in the thin crimson aura that now surrounded Issei. Issei dematerialized his helmet, looking at his hands for a short second, creating a rather awkward silence. Finally, the brown-haired man looked up and smiled at the god, a smile that gave him a great chill. The god's eyes widened in disbelief as Issei approached at approximately four times the speed of before, receiving a heavy blow to the cheek that sent him flying a large number of meters. Without being able to even react, Issei suddenly appeared on his back thanks to his great speed, delivering a strong double kick to the god that created a loud rumble and a shock wave, causing Loki to spit out a large amount of blood as he flew even higher, without even being able to stabilize. Loki did a great turn in the air and spread his arms with a great cry, stopping the flight abruptly and causing a strong tremor to occur for a short second. Loki quickly created another of his magical attacks as he watched as a reddish trail approached at high speed towards where he was. Issei quickly dodged to the side seeing that the attack was going to hit him squarely, deviating towards the red sky at a great speed. Regardless of this, Loki tried to attack him while he was moving at that speed, missing the magic attack, and being hit by a strong kick that sent him flying to the ground again. Before falling, Loki tore through two rocky mounds and landed with a crash on the ground causing a large cloud of dust to emerge, along with a large amount of debris and a crater of interesting sizes. It didn't take a second for the god to send all of the mounds flying with his power, to then clench his teeth tightly while he went with his maximum speed towards where Issei was. The brown-haired man dodged the blow with great ease, appearing behind him and giving him a strong headbutt that sent him flying again, although this time Loki recovered almost instantly, quickly attacking the brown-haired man. Loki tried to give him a big blow with his hand that Issei dodged without any difficulty, ducking his body. 180, 181. Issei quickly counterattacked, punching him hard in the abdomen that sank slightly into the god's body, making him writhe in pain. Even so, he didn't decide to end his attacks, so he quickly tried to attack him again, only getting Issei to catch his fist. He tried again with his other hand, receiving the same response. Seeing this, Loki tried to knee him hard in the face. Surprisingly, Issei lowered her face to collide with Loki's knee, generating a huge rumble along with a large shock wave. The second they hit, she could see Loki's bones shatter into a thousand pieces. 191, 192, Issei took advantage of the stunned pain, delivering a hard headbutt that broke Loki's nose, breaking his stance completely. Issei quickly took advantage of this and began another onslaught of punches for the third time, although this time was much different than the previous two. The numerous shock waves accompanied perfectly for all those times Loki was hit and bounced off in various directions, like a punching bag. Numerous knees and punches fell on the god, until finally Issei gave him a hard knee to the back that sent him at great speed towards the ground. Loki's body was completely embedded in the ground, and he couldn't help but cry out in pain, since Issei was still pressing his knee against his back. After that, Issei placed his foot under Loki's body, lifting him into the air with his foot and then kicked him hard in the chest that sent him flying several meters in the air. Loki continued to fly, while it could be seen how all his wounds were regenerated almost instantly. The god quickly opened his eyes, stabilizing in the air and remaining several meters from Issei. By this time, Loki was already exploding with anger at the humiliation he was receiving. Damn reincarnated demon, he spat out the god with great fury, as he flung his hands forward. I don't care if I have to leave you half dead, he yelled, causing hundreds of magic circles to appear behind him. You're coming with me, you fucking trash, he spat with great rage, the veins in his eyes marked beyond measure. Issei widened his eyes in surprise as he saw a gigantic magic circle appear in front of the god, which was almost as big as the entire battlefield. 
The hundreds of magic circles began to throw numerous small magic attacks towards the gigantic magic circle, causing it to begin to shine more and more brightly. Issei gritted his teeth at this, so he quickly extended both of his hands to his sides, causing red spheres to begin to form on his palms. Each sphere became as big as two footballs, and they kept growing at a rather slow pace. Meanwhile, the gigantic magic circle shone with great intensity, completely dimming the light from the sky. What's that? Gasper yelled, covering his eyes from the intense light that emerged from the gigantic magic circle. This is bad, Azazel thought aloud, creating a magical barrier, who was quickly supported by Rossweiss. Slowly, the small magic circles disappeared from the god's back, until there were none left. Take this, she screamed at the top of her lungs. Nordic devastation, a white magic attack of impressive proportions was thrown from the huge magic circle, which did not stop emanating from it. Seeing the gigantic magical attack speeding towards him, Issei brought both of his hands together, creating a sphere even bigger than his body. Double dragon shot, a gigantic crater was created at his feet after expelling the attack, spewing out one attack with the same proportions as the other. The attacks quickly collided with each other, stopping immediately. A huge shock wave ripped in all directions, smashing everything in its path. It was so big that it slightly agitated the spectators, even though they were protecting themselves. The crimson and white light constantly battled each other, as neither yielded to the other. It just can't be, Loki yelled, not believing what he was witnessing. His attack from him is as strong as mine. 242, 243. Issei was clenching his teeth tightly as he endured the pressure of both attacks, until he couldn't take it anymore. A A A A A H H H H H H H H H H D D R A I G. Explosion. The crater below Issei grew triple as large, at the same time endless giant debris was thrown into the air by the sheer force. The crimson glow intensified further blinding everyone completely and causing the dragon shot to grow to abysmal dimensions. RGGHHHHHH. Loki yelled loudly as he was slowly pulled under the pressure of the attack. This can not be happening. He yelled, watching as the dragon shot engulfed his magic attack at enormous speed, until it reached the magic circle, progressively cracking it at a great speed. Can't be. The magic circle broke completely, letting out a final cry from the god. You were supposed to be much weaker. A A A A A A H H H H H H H H H H H H H H H H H. He screamed, being completely engulfed by the attack, leaving no trace of him. The dragon shot continued to move into the sky until it finally exploded in a huge bang, creating a huge crimson sphere in the sky that generated a gigantic current of wind, forcing Issei to move away slightly. Issei dematerialized his helmet to wipe the sweat from his face while he watched as the enormous crimson sphere seemed to be convulsing, until finally it generated a gigantic reddish explosion that forced everyone to close their eyes. The gigantic tremor was so great that more than one fell to the ground, while they felt like numerous gigantic debris crashed against the barrier. After several seconds, the great energy finally dissipated, causing everyone to slowly widen their eyes. Everyone couldn't help but widen their eyes in disbelief when they saw Loki in the attack sector, his clothes in a mess, his gaze covered with fury as he held his arm in great pain. The healing is failing, Issei thought with a small smile when he saw the small wounds that the god had along his entire body. This is incredible, the god would think as he breathed slightly agitated. Issei would extend his hand without warning, creating a small dragon shot that was quickly shot towards the god who gritted his teeth at this, dodging it by a few inches, only to be hit hard by the brunette. Issei followed close behind as Loki swooped down with the idea of striking him again, slightly surprised when he saw the god found enough strength to react and stop in midair, delivering a nifty flying kick that knocked him a couple of feet away. Meters, although it did not cause him any damage. We already managed to stop the army. Sears X commented, appearing together with that extremely muscular man, as he carried a somewhat injured Seraphal on his shoulders. They're still fighting, Azazel commented, causing the three newcomers to look in slight surprise as two contrails of different colors flew through the air, colliding with each other numerous times, making small tremors felt even from that distance. Your pawn is quite interesting. The muscular man commented as he didn't take his eyes off her. When we meet in the final, you'll see that he has more than just surprises, cousin. 
Rias answered with a certain arrogance and great pride in his words. Before reaching Sarilord you have to pass over me, Rias. Sona commented with a small smile. And don't forget that you each have another raiding game to overcome, so don't jump the steps, because the fall will be very hard. Azazel said with a small smirk, causing the three involved to bow their shoulders. Loki turned in the air as he fell, creating a magic circle with the idea of hitting him. Issei stopped suddenly in midair, then waited for the magical attack and dodged it at just the last second, making Loki's eyes widen as he lost track of it completely. Where the hell did he get to? The god wondered internally, looking from side to side. 293, 294. Issei began to create a sphere in his hand, causing the luminosity to draw Loki's attention. The god fixed his gaze on him, and then laughed when he saw what he was doing. Do you think you'll hit me at this? Distance. The god questioned, knowing that the dragon shot is very slow when not charged with enough energy. 296, 297. Issei gave him a small smile, and threw the attack without saying a word. Dragon shot. 298. The god could not help but smile mockingly at what he witnessed. 299. Is seriously. The god questioned, beginning to stray to one side. A big smile appeared on Issei's face, who said the following. 300. Ophis's seal disappeared from one second to the next, making all the corrosive power that Loki emanated completely disappear. My forces. She thought to herself, her eyes widening in shock as she completely lost her stability and speed, watching in horror as the attack closed in on her. This, the god declared with wide eyes, as his face lit up more and more reddish. This has to be a damn joke. The magical attack impacted and completely covered Loki, causing the figure of the god to writhe completely and begin to give a few agonized screams that would scare more than one. Ah erg. A second later, a loud explosion occurred, creating a huge cloud of smoke. Loki was not long in shooting out of her, falling to the ground at great speed, where you could see how blood flowed from his body due to how damaged it was. Its crash landing caused it to eat a large amount of dirt. Loki started to get up, or so he tried, since he wouldn't stop shaking. When he finally managed to get up, his gaze instantly locked on Issei, who was flying several meters away. The god was completely carried away by his fury, going against Issei while giving a great scream. He can still move, Issei thought, genuinely impressed. Loki slammed his fist into Issei's uncovered face, unable to move it an inch. The brunette quickly summoned his katana and hit him hard on the head with the scabbard on, causing Loki to scream in pain and fall to the ground again. I will not permit, the god whispered as he struggled to his feet. I will not allow the personal toy of the filthy demons to continue to humiliate me. He yelled in great anger, spewing out a large amount of magic attacks that came out of his magic circles, generating a large cloud of smoke in a matter of seconds. Loki gave a final great shout, creating a magic circle a little bigger than the previous ones, expelling an attack that generated a small tremor in the place, enlarging the cloud of smoke even more. Loki soon fell to his knees, breathing heavily. He could only see the ground, and how the drops of his sweat mixed with the drops of his blood. His vision quickly began to blur, signifying his imminent defeat. The god's eyes widened slightly as a katana jabbed inches from his cheek, causing him to chuckle slightly. Where is the honor in defeating a god who could barely stand on his feet? He asked her, feeling Issei kneel down next to him. Don't be mistaken, I'm not as proud as Valley. She answered. I only gave up the hammer because I was sure I could defeat you. Otherwise, I would never play the head of my loved ones just to show my pride. He concluded, seeing how God smiled at his words. Loki felt that his body was about to collapse, but he found enough energy to say a few last words. You don't know how to tell your loved ones well, secure your teeth, he mentioned, before falling to the ground with a thud, becoming completely unconscious. I don't want to hear that from someone who turned against their own family. He declared the brown, standing up as he looked up at the reddish sky. What will they do with him? Issei asked, watching as Odin carried the unconscious Loki away in a magic circle along with Sirzex. Since we are in hell, Loki becomes their prisoner because he attacked this territory. Rossweiss explained, seeing how the battlefield had been completely destroyed. He now he will be treated and locked up in the eleventh gate of hell. The Valkyrie commented, slightly surprising the brunette. 
I've heard that name before, Issei would place a hand on his chin, thinking hard. The Twelve Gates of Hell, Penemu answered, joining the conversation. It is the abyss that exists between the very abysses of hell. A land impossible to control. A land with a magical density much greater than that of Elysium, being impossible to fly in that place. A completely desolate place and covered in destruction, where all high-ranking criminals end up locked up, running into more and more danger depending on which door number they are at. The Kadri explained. Also, there is a curious legend. Since this land is the oldest in the world and has such an immense and suffocating magical density, it is said that this is where the first supernatural being was born by the creator's own hands. Penemu narrated, unable to help but get a little serious. Great Red. Wow, that's an incredible legend, the brown-haired man declared, really impressed by what he heard. Among the dragons, there was always talk of that place. Tiamat commented, joining the conversation. It is said that the highest mountain of all the realms is located there. In its 11,500 meters high, the three pillars of the dragon gods that were born are hidden. They were even there from before the birth of Ophis and Trihexa, as if prophesying to the three strongest beings that would stand upon this magical world. The creation of a soul so powerful that it can contain all that amount of power and magic in itself. Does that mean that all the dragon gods were born in that place? Issei asked with great interest, since he had been completely hooked on the story. Just great red, Ophis was spawned in another gigantic riot of magic originating from the dimensional gap, while Trihexa was a mistake. The last statement caught the chestnut's attention. But they are only legends. Tiamat quickly calmed him down. The only one who was born close to the time of Great Red and who is still alive is Odin. But, to give you an idea, when he was born, a large number of kingdoms had already been created and the twelve gates of hell were left. They are very marginalized due to their remote position, in addition to the fact that, like heaven, it is impossible to enter from the outside because of the great barrier created by the magical density. The only way to enter is if you are a native of there, or that you I sent someone who can get in there. He concluded the dragon, looking at Issei out of the corner of his eye. Demons are native to that area, since technically that place is still hell. Tiamat paused for a short second, then stared at him. By the way, that place is not known as very dangerous just because of the criminals and the sweltering heat. There are a lot of monsters never seen before or thought to be extinct in that place. Really strong monsters, Tiamat explained, narrowing her eyes slightly at him. I think if the white dragon bearer entered the twelfth gate of hell, it wouldn't be so easy for him to get out alive if he was cornered by the two leaders in that area. He commented, lightly rubbing his chin. The twelfth gate is a slaughterhouse, and that is why I will never let you go there. The dragon concluded, Oh, I get it, the brunette commented, surprised that the twelve gates of hell is so much more than just a prison for high-level criminals. Hey, we're coming back, she ordered Rias to Issei, who quickly greeted her with a nod. As today has been quite a busy day, we will leave training for today. Azazel declared, watching as many breathed a sigh of relief except for Issei who didn't seem to be the least bit tired. Tomorrow we will all meet, since there is only one week left until the start of the raiding games. The Kadri explained, before disappearing. Saruard looked at Issei for a short second, though he quickly disappeared along with Seraphal, leaving Issei, Penemu, Tiamat, and Rosweiss alone. Actually, tomorrow there will be a meeting for everything that happened with Loki. Ross commented, clearing the matter up. I'll be there too, so we can say goodbye that day. The Valkyrie declared with a big smile. Very good, Penemu commented, making a small nod. Now that I think about it, I know we'll be training this last week, she commented, making Issei look at her with great emotion. For today, we've had enough. I'll tell you what I plan tomorrow, she concluded, receiving a quick nod from the brunette. I hope it's just as interesting as the last one, he exclaimed the brunette clenching his fist tightly as a magic circle was created under everyone. Penemu couldn't help but smile a very, very tiny smile. Something that did not indicate to be potentially good. It will be interesting for me, he thought, so that then everyone would disappear in the magic circle. Azazel looked from side to side as he sat at his desk, looking at everyone present. Looks like we're all here, the Kadri commented, looking at the Grimori entourage and Sitri who were all sitting on or near the armchairs. 
The only one who was a little apart was Issei, since she was in the corridor of the club talking with Penemu and Tiamat. Why do we meet a few minutes before the meeting? Sona asked, genuinely intrigued by the answer. I just wanted to tell you what kind of training you'll be doing this last week. Azazel stated, resting his hand on his chin. We will continue with the same process, except that you will get up a little earlier. There will be no more breaks on the weekends, and you will have to endure a couple of hours of training before entering the academy. Declared the god, the only ones who will train apart will be Rias and Akino, who still don't control all their power well. They will have to undergo a little training with Tannen. Hearing the name of the Dragon King, everyone froze for a short second. Let's just say they had met him before, and things had turned out to be pretty strange. Or rather, dangerous. If you're scared of the kind of training Tannen can give you, then you shouldn't even enlist in the raiding games. Azazel clarified with a rather sharp look, something that made Rias tense enough, causing the redhead to quickly shake her head. I thought so, the cadre declared with a certain grace in his words. In the meantime, I'll personally take care of Kiba and Gaspar's training. He commented, earning the attention of the two mentioned. Kiba is very close to achieving perfect control of his balance breaker, while Gaspar still has a lot to learn. Azazel would explain, before becoming very serious. In fact, I highly doubt that Gaspar will be of any use anytime soon. He thought, something happens, Kiba asked, seeing the oddly serious expression the cadre had. I was just thinking this is going to be too complicated, he commented, clasping his hands under his chin. If you kill someone during a raiding game without giving them a chance to surrender, you are disqualified. Azazel thought, looking at Gaspar carefully. This is a headache, he finished, giving a great tired sigh that he confused more than one. Saji, Azazel declared, earning his attention. With the new parts of your sacred gear, you have undergone a great change from your current power. You are still not used to your new increase in power, and it could be seen perfectly when you fought Loki. Your body depletes too quickly. In order to fix that, you will have to use your sacred gear throughout the week without deactivating it at any time during training. That will make you get used to your new power, which simply suffers from great instability. He finished the cadre, then turned to the others. As for the rest, you are ready, Penemu asked with his typical imperturbable expression, making Issei clench his fists tightly. Of course, she exclaimed with great emotion. As you know, you are the only one who has had a special training. A training that allowed you to miss classes for a few days. Hearing this, Issei could only lower his excited smile a bit, since she didn't know exactly what his pretty cadre was referring to. Luckily, we managed to finish this training a week earlier than planned. Being a weekend, it's the perfect opportunity to make up for lost time. The fallen angel commented, making Issei's smile falter a bit more. Penemu couldn't help but cross her arms, while Tiamat did her best to hide her laughter after the talk. Understand what I say, the cadre asked, making Issei start to turn pale as he sweated profusely, though his smile didn't disappear. You do understand, right? Penemu questioned, again, unable to help but raise an eyebrow. I want to die, Issei thought internally as he turned to stone. Start of Arc Chapter 42, The New Hero of the Valkyries the meeting had already started. There was Odin himself discussing different arrangements along with Sirzex and Azazel, while everyone else listened. Everyone except Issei, Tiamat and Penemu, who were in another room. After all, the cadre had wanted her to begin right now with the duties she was to perform. Issei didn't seem so reluctant to go along with it, since he didn't really care what they did about Loki. Or so he initially thought. We will lock him up there but we are the only ones who will take care of the place. Issei couldn't help but pay attention to Odin's words, who despite being a bit far away, could still hear them. The chestnut began to turn his pen on the page while thinking carefully. He was so immersed in his thoughts that he completely forgot the number of pages he was reading and the activities he had to do. Loki. Issei thought, remembering everything that happened yesterday. If he really wanted the prophecy unchanged, he could have simply fought with the intent to kill me from the start. But he didn't. Issei continued his thoughts, getting slightly annoyed. At that time I didn't think much of his words, but now. Issei nearly died of a heart attack when Penemu smacked her hands hard on the desk. 
Do not get distracted, she declared the cadre with an authoritative tone. Remember that you only have two days before you return to the academy. She concluded, narrowing her eyes slightly. I know, I know. He explained the chestnut, burying his face in the literature text. I'm already reading, good, declared Penemu with a satisfied nod, sitting down right in front of Issei to do her own homework. Meanwhile, Tiamat was reading some activities that her students did right next to Issei. A few seconds passed, bringing an impressive silence to the room. The three seemed very involved in their respective activities. That made only the sound of the leaves or the pens could be heard. Just when the mood had been set to perfection, the noise returned to the site. Here they are, boys! Rossweiss exclaimed with a big smile upon seeing them, making everyone jump a little. I was looking for them all over the complex. Shish! The two women shut her up at the same time, making Ross very nervous. Uh, sorry, she quickly apologized in a whisper. What is this? A library? She questioned the brunette internally as he rolled his eyes. I just wanted you guys to watch the show about everything that happened yesterday. Ross declared, sitting down next to Tiamat as he turned on the old television set in the room. I only now find out that the factions have their own news channels. Issei commented with great intrigue, making the other two women turn their heads from her to see how the interview had turned out. The first one turned out to be from the demons, where Sirzex had said that the battle had been complicated, although everything turned out to be much easier when they returned to find Loki on the verge of defeat, thanks to the efforts of the demons and the Grimori retinue, and Citri. This didn't sit well with Tiamat, who quickly changed the channel with a magic circle that simulated remote control. The second channel was referring to Grigori, where all the fallen angels rejoiced about how well they did in the main battle, downplaying what was Loki's battle. Something that within everything if it was true, since Loki was very hurt. But again it resulted in great upset for Tiamat when Barakil said that the bratty Grimori and Citri had taken care of the Asgardian god. He quickly changed the channel again, seeing how this time it was the angels, although they were giving a much more general idea of the battle, and not from such a centralized and arrogant point of view. But again, no one mentioned Issei. I do not like this. Tiamat spat to the side, causing Ross to startle as his saliva flew inches from his face, which quickly turned to ice and broke into small particles as he slammed into the wall. What's going on? He asked the brown-haired man, watching as Michael continued talking about what had happened, or rather, what his men had transmitted to him. It's not nice that those brats get all the credit. Tiamat spat with slight anger. You did all the work, and they didn't do anything. Neither they, nor their stupid entourage full of wimps. She concluded the dragoness, making Issei shrug. Not that I care too much. He commented on the chestnut, earning the gaze of the three beautiful women. I prefer to stay in the dark as much as possible. I'm not interested in fame or anything like that. He explained he, getting everyone to look at him in slight surprise. That can be kept by the president. After all, those things won't help me complete my goals. She finished explaining, crossing her arms with a smile. Actually, I don't know how to deal with those things, and I think they could become a nuisance. Asterisk that's right, mate. Diedrag commented through the gauntlet with great pride. Asterisk fame will not help you win battles. Brilliant, Tiamat exclaimed resting her chin on the leaves with a downcast look on his face. I thought I couldn't be bothered anymore, but I just needed to hear the voice of the underdeveloped lizard. A small smile appeared on the dragon's face when she heard a snort from Deidre, clearly annoyed at remembering that humiliating nickname. Now I feel a little better. She concluded the dragon, while she chuckled slightly at her antics. Penemu changed the channel, seeing that it was now Asgard. Everyone couldn't help but pay attention to the scene as an incredibly serious Odin appeared on the screen. What's with that serious look? Penemu asked for everyone, seeing how the god created a few seconds of quite tense silence. Ellipsis, ellipsis, ellipsis. Issei is the true hero who defeated Loki. In those moments, Issei's face turned pale, while the three women blinked a couple of times at what they heard. The Sekir Ut is the true hero. Ellipsis, ellipsis. Ellipsis, you are a hero. After assimilating what the god said, Issei jumped up from his seat, knocking the desk to the side. But that it does, she screamed at the top of her lungs. Meanwhile, 
Tiamat was only smiling as she saw that her beloved was beginning to earn the recognition he deserved. A few minutes later, relax, it's not as troublesome as you're imagining, Odin declared, while he was in the room of the four of them, trying to explain everything to Issei, who seemed to be half hysterical. The fact that the god was here indicated that the meeting was already over. Lord Odin is right, Rossweiss quickly backed up the god. News works just like the human world. Let's say that each faction is a country, and the population of each country believes only what the rulers of that country say. He explained the Valkyrie, making a great analogy. That is, they just don't inquire about it further. Anything from the outside is only taken as a negative or a lie. He concluded, getting Issei to roll his eyes. In that case, it sounds like relations between the factions are still pretty tense. He commented the chestnut, receiving a great laugh from the god. Did you really think that all the factions would become best friends just because they made a peace treaty? Odin asked with a slight mocking tone, making Issei slightly embarrassed. You have a point, Issei commented as he rubbed his hair nervously. You are very, naive, declared the god, as he beckoned to Ross with his hand. I wish the world were as simple as you make it out to be. It is a utopia that could be achieved, he answered the chestnut, leaning his shoulders without giving much importance to the words of God. It's true, but nothing is simple, she declared the cadre, drawing everyone's attention. There are many beings who love the idea of a dystopian world. How could anyone wish for that? She questioned the brunette, unable to help but raise an eyebrow. From the point of view of these people, Utopia would be a dystopian reality for the rest of the world. He answered the cadre, finally taking his eyes off the paperwork. Have you already forgotten about Cocobiel? It's true, the brown-haired man thought aloud, remembering the great conflict that the aforementioned had caused. In that case, there will be no choice but to eliminate those people. He concluded, rubbing his chin. Tiamat could not help looking at him with slight surprise at such a statement, since he said it with absolute coldness. It's funny to hear how those words come out of your mouth, when before you weren't even capable of killing an ant. She declared the dragon, showing a proud expression after the new attitude and character that was being created in Issei. Let's just say I've learned my lesson, the brown-haired man answered while rubbing his hair with a smile. Going back to the main topic, he declared the god after clearing his throat. In case you didn't understand, what Rossweiss means is that it won't matter what Asgard says in other factions, and, in fact, it would be rare for them to notice what we have to say. God concluded, the bottom line is that only our faction sees you as a hero. Ross finished, making Issei roll his eyes. That means your admirers in Asgard will now think of you as a true hero. She added Odin between laughs after seeing Issei's frozen expression. It didn't take long for the god's laughter to fade when he saw how Issei normalized his expression and Ross became increasingly sad. A somewhat awkward silence followed for a few seconds, making Issei slightly sad as well. I guess it's time to say goodbye. Penemu broke the silence, not taking her eyes off his papers. Yes, Rossweiss replied, unable to help lowering her head sadly. Seeing her reaction, Issei quickly approached her and placed a hand on her shoulder making the Valkyrie slowly look up in great surprise. It's been a lot of fun every time we got together, just like training. She explained, then wiped away the tears that were threatening to spill from her beautiful face. I hope that when you become the Valkyrie Queen, you can visit us from time to time. She continued, fixing her gaze on the other two women. I'm sure they would like to interact with you a bit more, too. She stated, causing Ross to fix her gaze on the cadre and the dragon, waiting for her answers with bated breath. Well, it's been kind of fun. It's a shame that because of work neither of us had much time to get to know each other, but the stay was very pleasant thanks to your help. Penemu declared, lifting her face, showing a small and unusual smile on her face, indicating that she meant it with all her heart. I think the same, it was quite a new and entertaining place. Tiamat declared with the same expression as Penemu until a somewhat dark look settled on his face. Especially in one of the last days. For some reason, I really want to protect my balls, the brown-haired man thought with a nervous bead of sweat as he placed a hand on his crotch. Penemu and Rossweiss just had a bad feeling when they saw how Tiamat chuckled in a very mischievous way. W well, I think the same, 
Ross commented with a small stutter. Because of what had happened. I hope that when I finish my training, we all have more time to get to know each other. She concluded with a big smile, something that the two women responded to in the same way. Finally, Ross Weiss's gaze landed on Issei, who greeted her with a small smile. Issei slowly moved his hand towards Ross Weiss's head, caressing it very tenderly. Ross Weiss couldn't help but blush slightly when Issei received her with an aura covered in warmth and affection that made her feel too good. I will miss you. Those words. Those words made her heart race a little again after so long. That feeling was so great and comforting that he couldn't resist. Issei's gaze widened in shock as Rossweiss hugged him tightly, causing him to stagger back a bit. The brown-haired man was able to respond quickly, hugging him back while he continued stroking her head, making the pretty Valkyrie bury her face in her chest. After a few seconds, in which everyone deigned to observe that farewell with a smile, Rossweiss separated from Issei with small tears that seemed to threaten to spill out of her face. I will miss you too. Apparently, many things have happened these days that I wasn't in Asgard, the god thought with a smile, seeing how Rossweiss had become a great friend. A few hours later, it was already completely dark. Issei had gone to her home along with Penemu and Tiamat, who were helping him catch up on the academy's homework. Of course, each one helped him in a different way. Issei and Penemu were in the living room, where the cadre seemed to be carefully watching what the chestnut was doing in his notebook. From one second to the next, Issei threw down his pen and raised both his fists in the air, to then get up from his seat while continuing with the same posture. Penemu couldn't help but smile at such a funny sight, while Issei continued with his hands raised and surrounded the entire living room in that same posture. What's going on? Tiamat asked, coming into the room with her hair tied in a ponytail, while he used gloves to carry a large platter that had plates of different foods. The delicious aroma quickly reached Issei's nose, making him abandon his posture and look at her with great emotion. You're done with your history homework, she declared the cadre, resting a hand on her chin. With this, he only has your subject left. I guess we can finish tomorrow, she concluded herself, watching as Issei quickly approached Tiamat. Great, I was starving, he exclaimed the brunette with a goofy expression on his face. He had a cherry tomato stuffed with melted cheese with high-quality ground beef and perfectly seasoned. Issei's expression changed to a completely holy one, where he swore that he was about to become an angel. It was worth waiting so long, he commented with a holy aura. As always, Tia becomes even more perfect when she cooks. She concluded, a huge blush breaking out on Tiamat's face at the nickname and the words, who raised the dish to cover it. Do not say those things. She ranted the dragoness. Although her face was almost completely covered, her beautiful blue eyes did not allow him to hide her unruly emotions. How envious, Penemu said, and her small smile made it clear that she was joking. Issei quickly put away the books and Penemu helped Tiamat to place the plates and other objects. The three of them sat in the armchairs while they ate leisurely, talking happily among themselves, laughing and having fun. After several minutes like this, Issei couldn't help but get silent as he watched with a small smile how Tiamat reigns for the stories of Penemu, who was smiling throughout the entire conversation. Issei just deigned to continue eating while looking at them with great joy. After a few seconds, Tiamat and Penemu realized this, so they looked at him with great curiosity. Didn't you like the chicken at the disco? Tiamat asked with great concern. Seeing this, Issei couldn't help but choke for a short second, as his reaction had seemed very funny to him. No, it's fucking delicious. He answered quickly while drinking a lemonade juice made by her. I was just thinking that. Issei's smile widened a little more as he saw how the two women looked at each other, then looked at Issei with even more curiosity. We look like a family. At the answer, Penemu and Tiamat instantly blushed. Something that Issei didn't notice, since he was very focused on his own thoughts. Like a couple, the two women thought at the same time, feeling how their bodies warmed up and their hearts beat harder. You know, like two big sisters taking care of their little brother. She finished answering, making the blushes of the two women disappear instantly. Ah, just that, Penemu declared, continuing to eat her dinner. This somewhat indifferent reaction from the cadre made Issei think that he had said something he shouldn't, although he didn't know what. Speaking of family, Tiamat added, as more food was served. 
We were very lucky that your parents were away on business until this Sunday. He concluded, fixing his gaze on Issei. That way, we can lie to your friends much easier about your whereabouts. Hugh, yeah, Issei stated, rubbing his hair in frustration. I had completely forgotten about it. Issei's slightly annoyed look radically changed when she remembered a certain important topic. By the way, what will I do the rest of the week? No training, Penemu answered quickly, earning the attention of Tiamat and Issei, who didn't seem very happy about the statement. As I said before, we already completed the objective. Take advantage now to spend time with your friends and distract yourself a bit. He explained the cadre, getting Issei to understand instantly. From what I know, you haven't been able to go out with them for a long time because of training. You're right, it would be nice to do it. Issei nodded, completely convinced at Penemu's words. By the way, you're not as busy as before, are you? The chestnut asked with great intrigue. You're right, she replied the cadre while sipping some lemonade. The peace treaty has softened many aspects between the factions, especially when it comes to the interaction between the territories of each race, since that was always the biggest problem. Issei nodded again, remembering all the trouble he got into when he entered that church to rescue Asia, just like when Kokobil almost started a war for breaking into the demon's territory. Thanks to that, I only have to deal with a few rape attempts by some idiotic fallen angels who don't even try to disguise their original sin a bit. Afterwards, it's Grigori's cases in general, mostly concerned with keeping order in the castle. He concluded the cadre, to then look at him with great interest while raising an eyebrow. But why do you ask me that? She questioned herself, making Issei smile nervously. I'll need help with something. But if you're very busy, I can ask Tiamat. The brown-haired man answered with great nervousness. Don't worry, she answered the cadre, outlining a tiny smile. Remember that you can always count on me. This last was said with great affection, something that Issei noticed with great ease. I know it, thank you. She responded quickly, expressing great gratitude. So, as I was telling you, Penemu commented, resuming her story. You don't know how good he felt when I stuck my katana between Azazel's legs for not doing his job. A few hours later, in Issei's bedroom. You know, anything you can call me. Declared Penemu from the doorway, watching as Issei was already wrapping himself in the blankets. See you tomorrow, she concluded the cadre, giving a quick salute before bidding her farewell. Issei responded with a smile, then covered himself with his sheets when he saw that Penemu disappeared through a magic circle. I guess next week will be pretty quiet. The brunette thought nonchalantly as he closed his eyes, preparing to fall asleep. After a few seconds of silence, he could hear a strange movement at the door. The first thing he felt was a great weight on his waist, as if someone had jumped on top of him. Issei immediately opened her eyes, seeing that it was the dragon, that she was wearing her black underwear, ready to sleep with her source of personal affection. It already seemed strange to me that you didn't come. Issei commented gracefully, seeing how Tiamat moved her hips on Issei's waist with great happiness, showing great tenderness that he couldn't ignore. After all, he looked adorable when he showed that side of him. Did you seriously think that I would lose a chance to sleep with you? The Dragon Queen questioned as she continued to rock her hips happily. Without a doubt, that question and his movements made everything miss think very easily. But that didn't really matter, since it was just the two of them right now. Yes, that's right, Issei thought out loud as he looked at her with a small smile. Just in those moments, the brown-haired man couldn't help but have a little look into the past. That feeling seemed very distant, but it was actually present in him not long ago. That feeling of darkness, of loneliness, somehow, he remembered how everything was very dark around him. There was only him in this dark, dreary, emotionless house that she called home. Since he was always alone, without anyone accompanying him, not even her own parents approved of her existence. Everything was so dark, but now, somehow, Issei projected that distant past where he was all alone. But now, she was on top of him as she gave him a feeling of happiness, care, tenderness, and about all those emotions, about all those beautiful sensations. Love reigned. After thinking all those things, Issei couldn't help but shed a small tear. He felt so special, just because that person in front of him loved him so much. 
Tiamat saw this, so she quickly became concerned and shed her aura covered in sweetness. What's wrong? He asked with great concern, bringing his face a little closer to Issei's. Ha, ah, it's nothing, Issei replied quickly, wiping away the tear. I only remembered the first day we met. He declared the chestnut, making Tiamat look at him with some intrigue. Or rather, all the special things we've experienced so far. After hearing her last words, the dragon couldn't help but be greatly impressed, and her face reflected it. At least, they are for me. Ha 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 ha, Issei exclaimed with great nervousness upon seeing Tiamat's expression. The dragon continued to look at him for a few seconds with a much softened expression while Issei laughed in embarrassment. Tiamat broke off her laughter as she lifted the covers and lay down to one side. An awkward silence ensued between the two. Or at least, that's how Issei felt. Quote ellipsis quote, quote ellipsis quote, quote ellipsis quote, can I hug you? Tiamat's question caught Issei's attention slightly. But, you're already doing it. She responded with great surprise, since the dragon was curled up on her chest. It's not the same. Tiamat whispered under her breath, making sure her imperceptible blush didn't grow too much. Turn to me. Issei quickly complied with the order, coming face to face with Tiamat. The brown's eyes widened slowly as he felt the dragon's arms encircle his back, asserting herself against him and making their torsos press tightly against each other. It took a while to do so, but Issei responded to the hug with some hesitation, surrounding Tiamat's back with his hands, unable to avoid blushing slightly as he felt how the dragon's neckline pressed tightly against his bare chest. His chest is very hot, the brown-haired man thought without a double meaning, since he really was hot. The surprises did not end there, since Tiamat got a little closer to him, making their foreheads collide with great delicacy and affection. Although, without a doubt, what impressed Issei the most were the following words. I hope these special moments last forever. Issei simply stared at him unable to respond to that statement. She could only observe how the dragon had her eyes closed with great tranquility, while she caressed Issei's bare back with her hands. Shit. The brown-haired man thought as his expression changed to a slightly tearful one, feeling how his chest burned with endless emotions that made him touch the stars. Why does it always have to be so, so? Issei tried to describe her with one word, but no word was found to be meaningful enough to describe her. Damn, you'll make me cry like an idiot again. Issei concluded her thoughts with a big toothy grin, as her tears threatened to roll down her face. Tiamat couldn't help but open her eyes with a slight blush when she felt how Issei got closer to her and began to caress her bare back. As long as we're together, I don't think those moments will ever go away. She finished the chestnut, making Tiamat smile slightly at her. You're right, she concluded with an expression covered in beauty, because right now she didn't care that her blush mixed with her beautiful smile. And that's how they both slept, united and caressing each other with great affection. The minutes passed, and Issei finally seemed to have fallen asleep. Tiamat seemed to have also fallen asleep, but soon after it could be seen how she opened her eyes. A mysterious shine lodged in them. Special moments, precious moments, the dragon thought as she slowly moved her hand, until she finally reached Issei's cheek, beginning to caress it with slow and delicate movements. Thank you for making me live such wonderful experiences, the dragon whispered, and then slowly brought her face closer. His lips slowly approached the brunette's forehead. Her beautiful lips pressed slowly to her forehead as Tiamat closed her eyes deeply. The kiss lasted longer than she thought. She slowly pulled away, then looked at him carefully as she continued to caress his cheek. She parked her gaze on his lips, slowly closing her eyes as his face came closer. Thank you for showing me what true love is, he thought, as her lips pressed slightly against each other, though there was no movement from her. After a few seconds, she pulled back slightly and gave him an expression covered in love. Te amo. Asterisk you were one step away from it becoming a real kiss, maiden in love. After hearing the most irritating voice in existence according to herself, Tiamat quickly blushed beyond power and moved her hand away from Issei's cheek. Be quiet. Tiamat ordered with a death look, who was not accompanied by his huge blush. Diedreg just laughed at her reaction. Even so, he decided to listen to the dragon, since she hadn't called him by that humiliating nickname that she always used on him. Somehow, this had been her revenge for calling him that in the morning, and Tiamat knew it. 
Everything indicates that she will be Issei's first kiss. Diedrag thought to himself with a small smile. But what would have to happen for that to happen? He wondered internally. In what context would the great fear and incredible insecurity of both be pushed aside for that to happen? The next day, Odin watched carefully as Ross went around his office, doing different tasks. He was seeing that she seemed to have returned to her sour temper, though he was trying his best to hide it. Though, of course, the god knew her too well to fall for her seemingly unruffled expression. After being silent for a while, Odin finally decided to speak. Why do you think the three of them get along so well? Odin's question made Ross stop and look at him in great confusion. What are you talking about? The Valkyrie tried to pretend that she didn't understand what she was talking about, but the god didn't believe her one bit. You know very well who I'm talking about. The god declared, placing a hand on his chin. Ross Weiss couldn't help but lower her head, thinking about the question while remembering all the loving and joyful interactions that Issei, Penemu and Tiamat always had. To be honest, I don't get it. Ross replied, taking a small sigh. Tiamat is a dragon queen who hates Diedrag and all bearers of it, and whenever she meets one, she kills it. Or at least, she did, the Valkyrie explained. And with Penemu, she doesn't understand how she can bond with a demon after getting rid of her original sin. In reality, the three of them belong to species that are simply incompatible. Ross Weiss concluded, remembering that the factions almost exterminated the dragons. Events bring the least likely people together, the god declared, earning Ross's special attention. Usually a common past, a show of empathy, a demonstration that it doesn't matter what faction you belong to, or whoever you are, everyone can have a heart if they want to. The god continued, looking at Ross with a smirk. But, it's rare that those factors come together in just three people. He explained, the fact that the three of them are broken people, made them bond without realizing it. Broken people, Ross Weiss asked, unable to understand what he was referring to. You already know Tiamat and Penemu's past, but you don't know anything about Issei. Odin declared, unable to help but get a little serious. Her feelings for him were used and discarded like trash. He was killed by his own girlfriend, who was a fallen angel. The god concluded, making Rossweiss widen her eyes with great disbelief at what she had heard. Those three broken people help each other and give love to each other. That way, their wounds heal slowly and progressively. She declared herself, outlining a small smile. Three broken people who love each other more than anything. I think I understand, Ross commented, lowering his gaze slightly. Do you think that? The Valkyrie clenched her armor tightly with her hands. Do you think they could help me when I become broken? Odin just watched her with a smile after the question. Speaking of which, you should rest from all this until your birthday. Odin's response shocked the Valkyrie. A vacation of about two months is a good idea, don't you think? He asked, making Rossweiss's eyes widen like hell. In fact, I understand that Kuo Academy was looking for a swimming teacher, the god concluded, making his intentions more than clear. Rossweiss's expression radically changed to a cover of joy as tears began to fall from her face. Thank you very much, Lord Odin. He yelled with great happiness, bowing deeply, then running out of the office. Odin only deigned to smile at the great happiness of what was almost like a daughter to him. As long as I'm alive, I'll do everything I can to make you happy, you little fool. In a place far, far away and inhospitable. A place completely unknown and unexplored by almost all beings. In that place so far away from everything there. Was a huge mountain that crossed the dense clouds that did not allow light to be seen anywhere, no matter what position you were in. The mountain was so high that the end could not be seen, something very striking to the eye, like that dense reddish aura that completely surrounded the entire area, hinting at the great magical density that was in that place, being a very stuffy and hot place to live. In short, the weak would have no chance of surviving in this place, as they would be destroyed before they could touch the ground. Behind that huge mountain, you could see a huge pink dome that was protected between huge natural walls, forming a gigantic mountain range that was impossible to cross, since, if we remember, with such a high magic density, it is impossible to fly, no matter who it is. True, it could be traversed, but very few would be capable of such an exhaustive climb. Inside the large pink dome, a small room that was white in color and completely transparent could be seen. 
Numerous magic circles adorned the walls, magic circles that seemed to be unbreakable. Or that's what the god who was trapped inside thought. Simply impressive, Loki would think, studying the entire structure with great fascination. A construction so recurring and simple that it is impossible to break through or break through. A masterpiece among prisons, he would say out loud, touching the walls, feeling how the magic circles were encrypted on the walls. A dimensional prison, the god would conclude to himself, no matter that they were watching him. And it's not just anyone. Odin spoke, opening a small grave so that he could hear him. Not even the dragon gods could get out of here that easily. In fact, I'm sure it would take a couple of years. Loki looked at him out of the corner of his eye after his words. I suppose your friend left you a nice present. The god commented, and then continued studying the structure. I see you quickly figured out who it was. Odin commented with some grace, making Loki make a little snort. There is no other person who can create these kinds of mechanisms. Loki explained. In fact, it is well known that it is thanks to him that we are all still alive. Before the end of the Great War, Elohim gave me this little gift, saying that I would need it later. The god explained, remembering his friend and his deceased. I would never have imagined that his use would be in imprisoning one of my sons. He concluded, unable to help but become serious. Poor you. Loki commented with slight mockery. One of your sons is a suspected criminal, and the other is just as idiot as you. The god paused, looking up for a short second. Well, you were that idiot until before the Great War. The god concluded, looking at him out of the corner of his eye with a small mocking smile. I guess these thousand years of stress and the near demise of our kingdom made you a bit wiser, and it didn't just make you a lot older than you appear. He concluded himself, knowing that Odin should have a physical appearance of 50, but he looked almost 60. Odin only deigned to laugh at his statement, remembering everything that had happened at that time. Finally, Loki looked up at the completely dark and reddish sky, looking at the huge mountain that seemed to have no end. Do you agree to leave me in the hands of the demons? Remember that this is their territory, declared the god, making his father become serious again. This dome is certainly strong, but if they manage to break through it, I'll be in trouble. He explained, turning his face to look at him. After all, I can't do anything from in here, and they could teleport me to the twelfth gate. Where I'd just starve, or worse. It was you who invaded their territory. The god answered, with great seriousness. We are very lucky that you were kind enough to give us this little area for us to monitor you personally. Odin explained, in short, no demon can come and go without our permission in this little place. He concluded he, looking at the large dome. I hope you're right, Loki commented nonchalantly, looking away again. Enough of small talk, you already know why I'm here. Odin clarified, narrowing his eyes. What did you talk about with Hyodo Ise? He asked getting Loki to look sideways at him. I only told him the truth. The god replied simply, I wanted to take it with me to make sure a catastrophe doesn't happen in the future. What the hell are you talking about? The god questioned, thinking that his son had gone crazier than normal. Loki turned around and approached him slowly, until they were facing each other, although they were separated by the transparent wall. I just want to prevent Ragnarok from becoming a lag. He concluded, getting Odin to raise both of his eyebrows. Ragnarok does not exist. After the destruction of the other kingdoms, it became very clear that it was only a false prophecy. The god concluded, making Loki let out a small laugh. Ragnarok has always been true. Only we focused on our own kingdom, on our own culture. The god explained, then narrowed his eyes. The apocalypse is something that doesn't just affect one culture or society, it's something that changes the whole world. I don't know what you have discovered, but trying to redirect Ragnarok to your liking cannot be good either. You would be breaking destiny and you would harm the cosmic balance. The god ranted angrily, the cosmic balance is nothing more than a joke. Loki declared, making Odin look at him in great disbelief after his words. The only thing that exists is a scale, the god declared, raising both hands. A scale that can break completely when trying to balance good and evil, since evil will always be heavier. He concluded, leaving only one of his hands up, graphing his theory. So you only seek to destroy the cosmic order? Odin asked, staring at him. I just want to bring peace to this crazy world. Loki exclaimed, 
strongly supporting both of his hands on the wall, generating a small tremor. A murderer can't do something as such. Odin contradicted him, causing Loki to make a small snort of derision at this. Do you really think a conservative mind could pull that off? The god questioned, causing Odin to turn around while he shook his head. Before you were a bit jealous and envious, Odin commented with slight regret. But after the death of your wife, you've gone completely crazy, the god just closed his eyes when he heard a loud bang, Loki having hit the wall with all his strength. That is not true, the god shouted with great rage. After the death of my wife, the last person who really cared for me, I managed to become more understanding than anyone in this filthy world. Loki began to breathe heavily after his outburst of anger, beginning to calm down. So understanding that you seek to break the cosmic order, the god declared, clasping his hands behind his waist. Can't there be good without evil? Loki questioned, looking up with a mocking smile. Each can exist without the other. It is best that we eradicate the other, before they eradicate us. Loki commented with a big, somewhat maniacal smile. That's how Ragnarok represents it. That's why Hyodo shouldn't help the demons. Because if he does, we'll lose. After hearing those last words, Odin looked at him with great confusion. After all, the evil of beings cannot be magically removed. Loki concluded, referring to the change of demons in the last millennium. Do you know things that I don't? The god questioned, staring at him. Loki just closed his eyes with a small smile, closing the small crack indicating that he didn't want to talk about it with his father. This is incredible, I never thought it would become like this. Odin thought with great pity as he watched his son sit down in front of a chess board, beginning to play by himself. Lord Odin, the aforementioned turned around to see a boy with short, straight white hair, while he was accompanied by more men behind him. The interior is already under control. We fear that there will be fluctuations abroad, not only in 11th, but in all other sectors. He concluded, raising his face slightly, seeing that his face had a certain resemblance to someone well known, although his expression, or rather, the lack of it, made him look somewhat fearsome. If you mean the possibility that they come to rescue Loki, honestly I see it as almost nil. The god commented, and then placed a hand on his chin. But, it's best to be 100% calm about it. The god rubbed his chin for a few more seconds, thinking carefully about what to do. You have my permission to patrol all the gates. Make sure the demons don't find out about this, as it wasn't part of the deal, explained the god. Very good, he answered the man quickly, dropping his bow. I'll have everyone do a general patrol in each sector once a week. That way, we'll divide the work among all of us so we don't get tired, and so there are always eight people guarding the boundaries of the dome. He concluded himself, receiving a nod from the god. One more thing, he declared the god with great seriousness, something that the other man did not miss. They shouldn't enter the twelfth gate, unless it's an emergency. As you already know, even you couldn't do anything in that place if they were located by the monsters. The god clarified, receiving a quick nod from the man. In that case, we'll only check the two gates that connect to the eleventh and twelfth sectors. He commented receiving a quick nod from Odin. Just when the god looked like he was going to leave, he stopped. One more thing, the god declared, looking over his shoulder to watch the man. Don't get into fights that aren't considered important. The god explained with great seriousness. If it's not something that could harm Asgard, stay out of it. He concluded, making the man take another bow. You know you don't need to explain that to me, Lord Odin. Said the man, I know, but it never hurts, the god commented with a small smile, then looked at him as he created a magic circle at his feet. By the way, your sister is really happy this time, Roswell. He stated, causing the now recognized as Roswell to look at him with a slightly surprised expression. I'm glad to hear that, she concluded, deepening her bow a little more, unable to help but smile at what she heard. Odin just smiled as he saw that Roswell showed some of his emotions, waving his hand in farewell. In those moments, a magical seal glowed brightly in his hand, a seal that seemed to be of demonic origin. That was the explanation of how he could teleport in and out of the twelve gates of hell. Roswell turned around, returning to his typical stoic silhouette as he looked at his eight companions and friends. 
who the vast majority had a different weapon, from a bow to a huge oz with a chain. Gentlemen, it's time to work. Chapter 43, Triple Date. Issei would stop at the huge set of departments that were within the academy. The brown-haired man couldn't help but look at each of the floors, feeling that each time the building seemed to be bigger and bigger, it was probably thanks to the constant entry of foreign students. His thoughts were interrupted when he could see how Penemu came out of one of the many garages that were in the place, carrying a large black motorcycle with her hands. Issei couldn't help but look at the woman with slight admiration, since it was the third time he had seen the cadre in normal clothes. Every time she looked like this, she brought a very different and exotic air of beauty, something that caught Issei's attention a lot. That sentiment probably stemmed from him, as she was wearing a popular British outfit along with a rather large straw hat that fit her very well. What do you want your motorcycle for? The cadre asked, as she stopped in front of him. That question made Issei stop admiring her and snap back to reality. We will need it, since we will have to act like someone normal. She declared the chestnut, something Penemu could understand, but that only further inflamed her curiosity. Where will we go? She asked herself, watching as Issei got on her motorcycle and started it up. Do you remember that I asked you for help yesterday? The chestnut asked, seeing that everything worked correctly. Well, the reality is that I need your help to hang out with my friends and my friends' girlfriends. He explained himself, then rubbed his hair with great regret. You know, it would be awkward if I go alone. Issei didn't finish the sentence, but Penemu understood perfectly. Well, it will help me to get out of the rut. Penemu replied, getting Issei to give her a grateful smile. Besides, she commented, sitting behind him, and then hugging him from behind with great affection. I'm sure it will be a bit of fun. She concluded, positioning her face over Issei's shoulder, who couldn't help but blush slightly at the intense and wonderful smell that the cadre gave off from her. While we're here, I'd also like to thank you for hiding my motorcycle around here. He commented the brunette, as he began to move. It was very helpful, as I was able to avoid any suspicion from my parents. It is not a problem, answered Penemu, closing her eyes placidly while she held her hat with one hand, letting the wind wave her beautiful black hair with great freedom. Later, in a cafeteria, the pervert duo were talking with their two girlfriends happily, where it could be seen that there were still two places left over. The four of them stopped their chats when they heard the ringing of a bell, making everyone look towards the entrance. Needless to say, the four of them were very impressed, especially Motohama and Matsuda, who felt their jaws drop on the table. There were Issei and Penemu, both with quite casual and luxurious clothes that made them look like extremely beautiful people. It was probably because Penemu has a figure that cannot be hidden with any outfit, while Issei had abandoned his always boring academy outfit, so now his black clothes were not so loose and made him look like a still thin young man, but with a very good physique. Welcome, a waitress quickly served them, seeing the two outlandish guests. Do you want a table? She asked her, outlining a tender smile. We are with them, Issei replied, pointing at his friends. The waitress quickly bowed her head, going to serve other customers. Issei and Penemu sat next to their friends. Penemu quickly took a letter, evaluating the different requests that she could carry out. It's good to see you again, friends. She declared Issei with a smile, looking at Matsuda and Motohama, who were sitting next to her. Issei couldn't help but look at his friends in confusion seeing the somewhat idiotic expression they were holding. When he was going to ask Murayama and Aika what was happening, he could see that both girls were looking at him with very similar expressions. Fuck. Issei. The brunette couldn't help but spit a little when Matsuda gave him a big slap on the back. You go away for a few days, and you become quite the gentleman. He concluded, laughing at his friend as he continued to pat him on the back, making Issei a bit nervous. That suit suits you very well. Motohama commented, adjusting her glasses as she gave him a smile with a slight nod. By the way, how was the trip to the United States with your parents? Aika asked, crossing her arms with a small smile. You told us you'd only come in a week, so what happened? I said that, he wondered the brunette to himself as he pointed at himself, receiving a very deep and penetrating look from Penemu II. Oh yeah, I said it, he exclaimed with great nervousness, understanding what was happening. It was amazing to hear, since they never took you. 
Matsuda commented, as he looked at Motohama. I hope they didn't send you back for creating some kind of trouble. Motohama sneered. They finished the job early. Penemu answered for him, getting everyone to look at her, while Issei breathed a sigh of relief at the thought that she had been saved from her. I see you have a good eye for clothes, did you get it from some business in the United States? Murayama asked, looking at the outfit Issei was currently wearing. In fact, Penemu bought it for me. He affirmed the brunette, causing everyone to divert their attention from him drastically. They all looked at Penemu for a few seconds, where they saw how an aura of beauty and absolute peace surrounded the cadre as she turned a page and continued reading in complete tranquility, moving a lock of her hair to one side. It's true, the four of them commented at the same time, cutting the silence that they themselves had created. Issei couldn't help but raise an eyebrow, he had already been surprised by such a reaction. The four of them fixed a penetrating gaze on him while knowing smiles formed on their faces. What kind of relationship do you have with the teacher? The four of them asked at the same time, making Issei visibly nervous. Although she couldn't find a quick answer, since she felt a warm and soft hand take hers, taking her to the middle of the table. The brown-haired man raised her face, unable to avoid widening his eyes at the great beauty that Penemu's face conveyed. He is my little dragon. That answer made Issei wince while everyone else nearly died at the revelation. Just when everyone was going to start gesturing words at what they heard, Penemu let go of Issei's hand, hiding her small laugh behind the letter. I was just kidding, she replied, turning her gaze to a particular coffee on the list. He solo is like a little brother to me, he concluded, making everyone laugh at his mischief, even Issei himself, although he still had a small blush on his cheeks. After that little joke, everything continued as normal. The talks came and went, where Penemu did not participate much and always remained serious, although it was clear that she was having fun. Probably because she was together with Issei, and any charity time she got together with him was always very nice to her. Which is said, it wasn't very difficult either, since nobody likes to work all day, and every day. The hours passed and the second cafe finally arrived, where everyone was about to leave to go to the movies. In the end you were quite right, Issei. Murayama commented, looking with great love at Matsuda. He's a great man, he commented, making Matsuda blush slightly at her girlfriend's words, though he quickly agreed to shake hands with her. Hugh, how mellow. Aika commented with a certain revulsion at what she had seen, although she didn't completely dislike it. See that we never become like that in public, Motohama. The woman commented, getting himself to adjust his glasses with his characteristic smile. That won't be a problem. She replied, showing that they both had a great understanding of each other when they barely met their eyes. Something that Issei didn't miss, and he couldn't help but smile when he saw his soulmates so happy. Anyway, it was too sweet a moment, and let's just say that Issei felt slightly uncomfortable about this. Although he wasn't the only one. Ya faller. Penemu's sudden question made everyone spit out their coffee, while Penemu continued to drink very subtly, as if she hadn't said anything strange. D don't you think that's a bit of an intense question? Questioned Issei, who couldn't help the tremor of his eyebrow at such a bizarre situation. Because, the cadre asked, raising an eyebrow innocently. It is another very healthy way of representing the love that a couple has. Penemu answered, making it clear that she didn't find her strange at all. You are definitely right, Issei thought with a hesitant smile on his face. But you can't just go around asking that to people you're just meeting. Well, Penemu hunched her shoulders as she closed her eyes. You don't need to answer. She concluded herself, downplaying the matter. Everyone stayed for a few seconds in a somewhat awkward silence, until Matsuda looked at his watch and widened his eyes. Curse, she yelled, getting up from her seat suddenly. We must leave now or we won't make it on time. He concluded, getting everyone up from their seats. They all left in two different vehicles so as not to be so crowded, where Matsuda and Motohama almost went crazy when they found out that Issei had his own motorcycle. Issei made a quick excuse, saying that it had been given to him by a cousin who lived far away, something that his friends greatly doubted, but they decided not to press the matter further for trivialities. Now that I think about it, we're in trouble, Motohama commented with great seriousness. What's going on? Matsuda asked with a raised eyebrow. 
Sweat slowly began to break out on Motohama's face. I didn't think Issei would come accompanied, so I only ordered five tickets. Oh, Issei commented with his eyes rolling, as three ellipses appeared above everyone's heads. There is a solution, Penemu declared, watching as the group watched her with great attention. I just need to be left alone for a moment. I'm a friend of the manager. She commented, making everyone look at each other in great surprise. Do you really know the generator? Issei asked in great surprise at what he heard, knowing that Penemu doesn't interact with any human. We are close friends, she answered the cadre as she winked at her, making Issei understand the woman's true plan. Very well, then we should go ahead. He stated her brown hair as he headed to the living room, not allowing her friends to reprimand him for not waiting for her, although he didn't seem to hear her complaints. Penemu quickly looked in various directions, seeing that there were few guards in place. She went to the nearest bathroom without generating any kind of suspicion. The ticket collector let the five through with a smile, then stood his ground at the entrance. The man seemed to be calm, but that tranquility was somewhat broken when he felt a strong breeze that passed by him, so he quickly looked, finding nothing. He finally bowed, not seeing that the cadre had hidden behind one of the doors. Penemu poked her face in slightly, seeing that he was no longer looking in her direction. She entered with great secrecy, making sure that the guard did not find out that there was someone behind her back. Look, it's her, Motohama commented in a whisper, seeing how Penemu was looking for them with a look as he slowly approached between the different rows. They really let her in. Murayama thought aloud with great surprise. The teacher has many contacts. She concluded herself, where the others seemed to think the same. Everyone except Issei, who knew exactly what he had done. The brunette raised his hand, making Penemu see it. She quickly approached him, seeing that all the seats were completely full. Wait a minute, where are you going to sit? Matsuda wondered, seeing how Penemu seemed to have no free seats. I managed to convince him. The cadre commented, as she passed between Issei's four friends. The bad thing is that now I owe him a favor. The eyes of the four widened, and Issei's expression twisted to one of stupefaction when he felt how Penemu sat on his lap, leaning slightly to the side so as not to block his view. Shit, how can he smell so good? Issei thought as she closed her eyes, hugging the cadre by the waist, who didn't seem at all surprised by such an act. In fact, she seemed quite comfortable with her action. Matsuda and Motohama looked at each other with their girlfriends, to then look at Issei and Penemu again. Well, Actually, it's not a big deal, the four of them thought at the same time, although they couldn't help but think that their relationship seemed to be quite close. After all, it was strange to see how Penemu accepted Issei's hands surrounding her waist with complete tranquility. As expected, Matsuda and Motohama chose a romantic movie to watch together with their girlfriends. Not that Issei was upset, but he was really bored with these kinds of movies. What he didn't know is that Penemu didn't like that kind of theme either. In fact, he only liked movies that talk about history. After almost two long hours of boredom passed, Issei was about to fall asleep. Just when he began to nod off from sleep, he suffered a small shiver throughout his body when he felt how Penemu laid her face on Issei's shoulder, turning her body a little to lean even more comfortably. Penemu, Issei whispered to her, to later realize that she was completely asleep. This made him smile, as his expression seemed to be excessively relaxed as his face rested on the shoulder of the man he loved. Issei placed a hand on the cadre's head very carefully so as not to wake her up, and then began to caress her. Penemu leaned even more into his shoulder out of sheer instinct, unable to avoid a small smile. I wish I could always sleep with you, he said, making Issei stiffen a bit. He covertly turned his gaze, seeing that Motohama didn't seem to have heard anything. He saved. Issei couldn't help but give an internal sigh, since he knew how normal people reacted when it came to sleeping with someone of the opposite sex. She still remembers very well when Roswai saw them, although it is also true that the Valkyrie's reaction had been somewhat exaggerated. After a few minutes, where Issei was treating her with the greatest warmth and care possible so she wouldn't wake up, the movie ended, causing everyone to start leaving in great silence and calmly. I guess I'm not sleepy anymore. Issei thought with slight surprise when he found out that Penemu had completely taken away his sleep, and that she had only been looking at him while caressing his face. Is she asleep? 
Motohama whispered to her, watching how Issei was treating her, along with the other three. Yes, I'll try to handle it carefully, Issei commented, getting up slowly as she carried her like she was a princess. The four of them watched as Penemu leaned against Issei's chest out of sheer instinct as she smiled a little. Something that impressed them a lot, since they did not see her smile at any time. When they got outside, Issei had no choice but to wake her up, something Penemu didn't. Greet with good humor at first, but she quickly accepted it, knowing that it was going to be impossible to ride the motorcycle any other way. Finally, the friends said goodbye, with a friendly greeting. The men gave each other strong slaps on the back, while the young women greeted each other as best they could with the woman, since she was too serious in all matters and at all times. The four riding in the car watched as Issei left on his motorcycle without giving a loud honk as a farewell, leaving the place with a big skid that made more than one laugh. You know, I just realized that we were fools, Matsuda stated, watching Issei's figure quickly fade away. We never realized that perhaps Issei would be very uncomfortable making an exit like that. After all, he was the only one without a girlfriend. You may be right, but we learned something important, Aika declared with a smile as she adjusted her glasses. Did you notice it too? Motohama asked, adjusting his glasses. What are you two talking about? Murayama asked with a bored look, knowing that her friends had already started conspiracy thinking about her. Well, I think those two were very close at times. Especially during the movies, Motohama stated, adjusting his glasses. I don't know, friend, Matsuda declared, knowing where Motohama wanted to go. Penemu must have a lot of suitors. You know, she and Tiamat are the most popular teachers in the academy, and with good reason. In fact, we don't even know if she has a boyfriend, Murayama declared, to which Motohama couldn't help but break into a big smile. Issei doesn't know, but I could hear something, he commented, making everyone look at him closely. When Penemu fell asleep, she told him that she would always want to sleep with him. This statement caused everyone to look at each other in great surprise. Do you think Issei has a chance with the professor? Matsuda questioned with great emotion, since she wanted to make official triple dates with her best friends. Perhaps, but it will be better to wait for the right moment. Motohama declared, adjusting her glasses. Something tells me that you both have to go through a very important circumstance to declare yourself. An important circumstance? Murayama questioned, unable to help but raise an eyebrow. Evidently, Motohama did not know that he was completely correct. You know, Issei isn't graduated yet and that could cause a lot of problems. Although, it was obviously not the circumstance he was raising. Finally, Matsuda started the car and everyone left. Meanwhile, Issei and Penemu had already arrived at the academy, where they were heading to the cadre's room. It wasn't as fun as I expected, but it was nice to meet the two friends who were always there for you. She commented the cadre, giving him a small smile. Yeah, I knew you wouldn't have a problem with them. Issei declared with a toothy grin, as she rubbed her hair back. See you tomorrow at the academy. She concluded the cadre, closing the door without first giving a wave, a wave that Issei responded to. Issei was ready to leave through a magic circle, but he was surprised when Penemu opened the door again and gave him a big hug, making his face intensify in an intense blush. Thank you very much for inviting me, she exclaimed, as a smile broke out on her face. Issei could only answer the sudden hug, since he had run out of words. A few minutes later, in Issei's room, Issei's parents had finally arrived at the home, where the two of them didn't even pay attention to Issei and went straight to Tiamat asking her if she had gone to class and hadn't caused her any undue inconvenience during her stay out of the country, in where the dragon obviously supported her lover, making her parents stay calm for the moment. After dinner, Tiamat helped Issei with his chemistry homework, having a pretty normal relationship while staying in the eyes of their parents, as Mrs. and Mr. Hiodo only saw it as a student-teacher interaction. Finally, it was time to go to sleep, where Issei lay down without being able to avoid thinking about a certain hug that Penemu gave him. I didn't think she would be so excited about something so simple, the brown-haired man thought with a small smile, remembering the happiness he had expressed when he hugged him. I suppose I could take advantage of my free time to hang out with her more. In fact, we should hang out with Tiamat too, she thought to herself, unable to avoid a big smile at her last thought. 
I'm sure that would be a lot of fun. From the corridor, it could be seen how a strange figure slowly opened a door, and began to move in the corridors as if it were a thief, possessing great stealth so as not to wake up Issei's parents. It would be interesting to take them to an amusement park, Issei thought, unable to help but remember Rossweiss after his words. Issei placed his hands under his pillow, unable to help but look at the ceiling with great curiosity. I wonder how she is now. His thoughts were interrupted when he saw how his door opened apparently by itself. Her expression twisted to an amused one after the door closed, leaving no one in sight. Within a few seconds, a certain dragon emerged from the ground and placed her chin on the edge of the bed with a daring smile. Good night, she exclaimed, jumping on the bed while doing her best to tickle Issei, who was dodging all the assaults in a masterful manner. The sheets flew quickly, and they began to hit the pillows, while silent giggles emanated from both of them. The next day, Issei was in the old Kuo Academy building. He was very early, so he was just starting to get people for classes. Something strange about Issei was that he was wearing a black blindfold that completely covered his vision. Are you sure that by just doing this I can develop my dragon senses? He asked the brown-haired tenant of his, receiving a small snort indicating that it was so. You have already adapted very well to my power and developed splendidly. The dragon explained while smiling. If you repeat this procedure for a couple of days, your sense of smell will evolve and you will be able to sense not only the characteristic odors of each dragon, but also their auras. The dragon explained, Yes, I remember that feeling. Issei commented, remembering that time she was able to see Tiamat's aura when he got trapped in the familiar realm. Besides that, the sensory sense of dragons will help you with something very important. Diedrag declared, earning Issei's attention. When you manage to develop it, you will be able to feel when a dragon is secreting her pheromones. The dragon explained, making Issei raise an eyebrow. What the hell do I care? The brunette asked, making Diedrag laugh. You care very much, partner. The dragon declared, when a dragon expels pheromones from her, it means that she is extremely aroused. In other words, you will know when Tiamat will start to be affected by her mating season. The dragon concluded, then turned slightly serious. I can't tell you that those pheromones can only be felt by the dragon they choose as a mate, or else he might screw up. He thought to himself, remembering how Tiamat threatened him if Issei was told how the mating season really worked. That would allow me to escape in time to make sure things don't get complicated, the brunette thought aloud, remembering how the few times something strange happened with Tiamat, she usually managed to have enough self-control to get away. From him and not violate it, although he also remembers that resisting her was extremely difficult for her. It's a very useful skill. She concluded the chestnut with a smile. Not so fast, partner. Diedrag alerted, causing Issei to raise an eyebrow in confusion. The pheromones can make you lose control too, although to a much lesser extent. You should always keep a cool head, no matter how many times your libido reacts. The dragon explained making it clear that Issei was going to be in trouble, with his mini Issei if he could smell the pheromones. So would it really do me any good to learn this? Issei thought with a big drop of sweat, since he wasn't sure to proceed. This ability will develop sooner or later, since it's in your genes thanks to me. The dragon declared seriously, don't worry, I already told you that pheromones will affect you to a much lesser extent. He explained, then softened his voice. Listen to me well. If you really love Tiamat, then you won't have any problem escaping from those situations. The dragon concluded, knowing that Issei would never be able to do anything to Tiamat against his will. Although well, she wasn't exactly acting, against her will, but Issei didn't know that. Now that I think about it, the brunette commented, diverting the main focus. Don't dragons have any kind of. Issei was thinking of the right word not knowing exactly how to describe what she wanted to ask. Hormones, he concluded, something that made Diedrag burst out laughing, making Issei blush with embarrassment at his stupid question. Of course, all damn males have hormones. The dragon clarified, not believing that this was a real question. If you mean the effects of these, let's say they don't have one as such. They're still very similar to humans. The dragon explained with a little analogy, so you know how far they had. Of course, 
You must remember that humans have a much less developed sense of smell than any supernatural being. In fact, dragons have the second best sense of smell in the whole world, only behind the Nekomatas. The dragon finished, causing Issei to raise an eyebrow. And what does smell have to do with it? Issei asked, unable to find any relation. Well, that's an interesting question, Diedrade commented between laughs. Our white shots have an essence. Azazel's voice made Issei take off his bandages, seeing how the Kadri made a somewhat amused gesture with her pelvis, managing to place more emphasis on his words. What Diedrade is trying to say is, that smell can be very tempting for some women. The Kadri explained, sitting next to Issei as he crossed her legs. Now, imagine how a woman who can smell that fragrance 15 times stronger than a human would feel. He concluded, seeing how Issei's face gesticulated in different ways, making the god laugh slightly. That's why, the Kadri commented, getting up. You should always make sure you're really clean, man. The man concluded, extending his fist to him in a final gesture, before leaving him with a quick salute. You never know when the time will come. Issei just stared as the Kadri left after grabbing his briefcase, making the room intensely silent for several hours. Quote dot dot dot. How did the conversation get to this point? The brown wondered internally with his eyes rolled back. The brunette quickly downplayed what had just happened, giving a little jump as he placed his briefcase on his back, knowing that classes started in less than half an hour. Just as he was going to leave, Rias opened the door, causing both of them to look at each other in slight surprise. It's her, the brunette thought, remembering all of Loki's words. Something happens, she asked the redhead, watching as Issei stared at her intently. It's nothing, Issei commented as he rubbed his hair with a smile. It's just that Loki's words are tormenting me a bit. Oh, it's true, Rias commented. I remember they had a little chat before the match. Rias placed a finger on his chin, recalling the events. Just ignore those words, he concluded, inclining his shoulders. They were just the words of a poor man desperate to escape. Don't let them fool you so easily. She clarified his mistress, downplaying Loki's words. Yes you're right, he commented with a small smile, then walked past her. I'm in a hurry, sorry, president. She declared, leaving quickly, something that slightly misses Rias. Come on, she exclaimed the redhead with a small pout. Just when I wanted to ask her to take a bath together, he whispered to himself with slight annoyance, then smiled again. Well, I'll have another chance later. Partner, Diedreg questioned, seeing how Issei had quickly moved away from the site. Something strange about him. Tiamat, Loki, Valley, Tannin, and even you warned me about demons. He thought the chestnut, starting an internal conversation with Diedreg. I just can't give you my trust openly anymore. Although I might as well be being paranoid, but I'll watch more carefully from now on. It's strange that you think that way now. Diedreg commented with some curiosity, since Issei had always been someone very confident. I'm not scared by what Loki said, or at least, not in the main, the brunette explained, remembering all the talk. That I can't save the already doomed species seems stupid to me. After all, the prophecies serve to avoid disastrous omens, don't you think? He questioned the brunette, then narrowed his eyes at him. What was breaking my head was one of his many delusions, he commented, remembering a specific part of the talk. He always meant that all the devils knew his fate, or so he implied. Something that can't be the case, since only Sirzex should know about that prophecy. And why do you believe in those words, and not in the others? The dragon asked, very interested in the reasoning that Issei was taking. It's not that I believe or not, it's just a matter of logic. He lightened the brown, remembering all the things he'd learned so far. From the beginning, they let me be trained by people who belong to other factions, which, if I remember correctly, all the factions always had a great tension between them, which has even been present after the peace treaty. He stated the brunette, putting his hands in his pockets. Don't you find it strange that at that time they risked losing me so much just so that I would receive the best possible training? Issei questioned, then raised an eyebrow. It can also be a contradictory factor, but it's still fucking strange. Maybe he's being a bit of a conspiracy. The brown-haired man concluded. So what will you do? Diedreg asked, getting Issei to shrug. For now, I'll just stay out of it. He answered the chestnut, 
closing his eyes. I don't want to have unnecessary problems just because of suspicions that still don't have tangible proof. Issei stopped in front of the door, looking at the huge establishment. Though one thing is clear, I used to think that devils had become a good species, since they were now reviving humans, they even gave me a second chance. But, I don't think the same way anymore. She concluded, making his gaze drop a bit. I understand the supernatural world better now. I know full well that my president only revived me because I possessed a sacred gear. That's not an act of kindness, let alone an act of charity. You were simply revived through a contract in which you don't you have your word, Issei explained, and then take a big sigh. They're clearly not good, but they can't be considered bad either. In part, they only do that to ensure the survival of their species, since they've been left on the line after the Great War. He concluded the brown, to then remember a certain half-vampire. But there are certain past attitudes that make me lean a bit to one side, he finished, slowly entering the academy. Apparently, Diedrich had been very satisfied with what he had heard, since he did not ask him any other questions. A few minutes later, today we will announce a new teacher. They were all in the huge gym, listening carefully to the statement from the director, who was Sirzex himself. Everyone was paying attention, except for someone who still had quite a few doubts in his head. Also when they locked me up in the familiar kingdom for three days, the brown-haired man thought as he had a hand on his chin. But that can't be considered an evil act, since it was a just punishment for not having helped them when I should have. Issei continued with his not-so-healthy speculations, without noticing how a well-known face landed on the microphone. After a few seconds, Issei reacted to Sirzek's words, making him blink a few times. Wait, a new teacher? She wondered internally. For some reason, this gave me a lot of deja vu, he stammered, while she rubbed her head intensely. My name is Rossweiss, the Valkyrie exclaimed, causing Issei to widen her eyes in shock. I'll be the new swimming teacher. Ah, so this was, the brown haired commented with blank eyes as he fixed his gaze on Ross, who was greeting the students with a radiant smile that gave off a lot of energy. Thanks for watching like share and subscribe for the next parts one got in my storage.